And uh, we're live. Um, hello, everyone. This is Abdullah Samir, and I'm joined by two very special guests today. And all of you already know Abdullah Gondal, so he doesn't even need an introduction, but uh, Pakistani ex-Muslim now in Canada. Mufti Abu Laith, uh, I'm hearing myself a little bit. Um, anyways, Mufti Abu Laith, he is quite, quite a fellow, quite an individual. Um, I really like him, and the reason why is... Um, I find his views to be very reasonable. Um, he's he's an actual mufti, so he actually studies Islam, he speaks Arabic, so multilingual. Um, and as well, he has actually spoken on behalf of ex-Muslims multiple times. He said, leave ex-Muslims alone. So there's, some of you might know him from my channel, actually, because I've uploaded a couple of clips. I really like the fact that he said, you know, leave ex-Muslims alone, you know. I really like the fact that um, you know, the trajectory hermeneutics, I like that approach, that Islamic approach, I thought that was fantastic as well. Um, and this is probably the most requested uh, interview so far. Uh, people keep asking, talk to Abu Layth, talk to Abu Layth. And why is that? Why do people want to talk to Abu, want us to talk to Abu Layth? Because he has come up with, you know, certain ways to resolve some of the issues that we're coming up with, right? So for example, I had a video, 10 Strange Rulings in Islam, and he did a response to that, and he actually responded to each one of those points, right? And so, so people are asking, well, well, what's your problem now, right? And and the thing is, I'm happy. Like I really like those those responses. If if this this way of looking at things is it's refreshing, right? And not to mention, you know, some of the other things. And so I'm gonna hang hand it over now. So uh, you know, uh, all the best with the conversation, uh, Abdullah Gandal. Uh, over to you. All right, let's get this started. I am so excited. I mean, this is going to be uh, one hell of a conversation. I mean, this guy, Sheikh Al Islam, Mufti Azam, Mujaddid, Mushtahid, Imam Ahle, Sinar Zawala, Fitna Wal Jama, Mufti Mulana Abu Lais, Namad Barakatahumul Ali, Rahimahumullah. Tell us about uh, about a little bit about your past, how you became a Mufti. And I remember back in the day you had those, those beautiful Zulfi and that big. Big, big, but dirty. <laughs> I noticed you both have you both twist your mustache. So I think, are we are we both are we both live now? We're both live. Yeah, we're live. We're on. <laughs> All right. So, people, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Shukran. First of all, uh, anybody uh, viewing this and yourself, I think it's an awesome opportunity to really. Uh, have a discussion to get some dialogue going. It's been, I mean, we've been in, we've been in touch uh, uh, for for a little while now, uh, Abdullah Abdullahji, but uh, we've not managed to get, <laughs> good, not had some uh, intimate conversations yet. But uh, Alhamdulillah, sounds awesome. Uh, what so? What's going on? <laughs> what's going on? How can we, how can we reconcile these worlds? And so, will it? I mean, first of all, just to um, just to to kind of get a bit of a, a backdrop, uh, those people that that uh, I suppose already know me, that they're familiar with some of my studies and things like that. Those uh, that don't, I mean, I've done Islamic, um, I've done Islamic studies. I've pursued them for now. I mean, if I'm still considering myself to be learning, which I am, um, it's probably been over two decades now so i believe really began maybe 97 that kind of going into 98 that can be right i don't know where you were at that time of the lot <laughs> <laughs> i was in, i was in what grade uh, well i was actually just four years old man. <laughs> <laughs> nobody knew that there was going to be a there's a huge fit and facade <laughs> erupting within the four-year-old <laughs> <laughs> no, so, uh, yeah, so I mean, at that time, and I kind of traveled, I studied first locally here in the UK, in Birmingham, and then I went off to Damascus, the road to Damascus, uh, tr uh, had to kind of tread that path. Um, studied there for a while, maybe a year and a half, something like that, and I went to Pakistan, Islamabad, I did my uh, in the Quran. I don't know. Uh, are you from Islamabad, by the way? Is it, is it actually, around that? Was it close? Yeah. I okay. grew up in that okay, area. So, Islamabad, Rawalpindi. Yeah, <laughs> that's my hometown. Wow. So, you know, there's a, there's a, a place um, 
by I think Rahul Dam uh, a bit further. It's called they they call it like Nursery Town or something. I don't know if they changed the name now. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Chak, there's an area called Chak Shazad or something. Oh like yeah, yeah, Money it's been so long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they used to have they used to call it nurseries. They used to have like all these plants and things like this uh, over there. You can go and buy plants and there's loads of them. And but uh, if that's where the madrasa was, it was Peer uh, Karam Shah Sahib's madrasa, and so I studied. Uh, my hips and some of the tafasi is there and then I kind of in between went back to Damascus I read the entire Quran to uh, one of the shiur garijas uh, studied some stuff there then came back to Karachi um, yeah. completed uh, the alim course the alimia course in Jamia Binuria so what's the name Madrasa because there's two there's two uh, Binuri kind of institutes there so there's Binuri town um, which is probably about and 15 minutes away so that's in an area I don't know if they changed the names now by the way I think they used to it used to be called uh, Guru Mandir or something like that that's where that is and then our uh, Madrasa is about 15 minutes away it was in a in an industrial site called Site it's actually called Site mm. and it's Jamia Binuri so I did my uh, my alamia course they finished it um finished my mufti ifta uh, which was an additional two years and and that's where <laughs> that's where the journey begins All so right. I, mean, I, I definitely i came back and um i think like many people over the years uh, my thoughts you know developed further i think i've um you know, I came back. I, I I went to university. I did a I finished. I did a teaching degree in religion. Um, I did a master's as well. But I, I completed a psychology degree, uh, which was part time. And a lot of these things kind of got me thinking further. The reason I say further, I I did used to think before as well, quite critically. Um, it's not that I didn't, even when I was in Pakistan, I was, or in Damascus, or I think I've been critical of many kind of views. But maybe the paradigm shifts as you develop further. So maybe you start to then question other things that you, you weren't questioning. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's been going on ever since, really. I taught um, at a professional level in you know, whether it was a school level, religion, languages, like or at a college level. Um, I, I did that kind of stuff. And I've really, ever since, and then I, uh, that was you know, for a considerable while. And then I just became my, a hermit. <laughs> 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 a hermit spreading my own facade. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. No, so, so, I remember yes, watching uh, videos of you with like the beard and like the topi and the kufi and everything with the tobe. What yeah, happened just, from there just, to? You see, to be fair, the, the beard was always pretty much this kind of size, but it was just round the size. Of the so <laughs> it wasn't uh, because one of the things I, I used to get into trouble for when I was in Pakistan was the beard. So. They would say, you know, you're not allowed to, like, why is your beard not, because uh, <laughs> they used to say to me that, oh, you're trimming the beard, <laughs> <laughs> which, which I was. <laughs> so I used to be like, what, me? Me? No, it just looked like, <laughs> I've just got spiky hair, that's all. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so they, uh, so it was pretty much, around that kind of size but it was just around um and then gradually as i suppose had more freedoms it kind of went down, down, down. and then eventually i thought where's that razor thing i thought wow wow <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, i mean to, to me the, these things are I mean, the beard, I've got to, I mean, I think these things are really relevant and, and people have just made them into an issue. But it was, it was somewhat difficult as well going transitioning because you kind of, you've been for so many years. You have to remember I left just as I kind of turned 18 to go off and study. And I spent probably the next seven, you know, borderline eight years like 
just traveling, studying. Uh, it wasn't, you know, even though in between I came back once or twice, but uh, for a short visit, but I wasn't, you know, I, the world had changed by the time I got back. <laughs> it's not easy just kind of coming back at that age and then just to hit the ground running isn't something that's so easy. And you will be confused. You will, uh, and, and there's things of understanding what it, what, what is the faith and what is cultural identity uh, and not playing into these kind of politics and learning to differentiate bet between these things. It can take a while. And it also requires a healthy environment to be able to do that. So having the right kind of friends, having the right kind of circles, these things are important as well. All right. That's actually quite amazing, like your story. I didn't know that you traveled to many, so many different places. I know you had been to Karachi and stuff, but uh, it, it's similar because my, my own story is uh, at around the age of 15, I became super, you know, practicing like like Wahhabi style. I had uh, one more story, you know, coming out the end, no mustache. <laughs> and I used to wear like... Uh, the trousers halfway up my shank and uh, only kurta shalwar, no jean. <laughs> and then when the Mulvi Saab, uh, when he'd be gone on vacation, I'd be the kid giving the azan and, you know, doing the, cleaning the mosque and stuff. Uh, but then eventually I came uh, to Canada at the age of 19 and even, and then I became more religious, funny. I gave khutbas for two years and I converted this uh, this uh, gora uh, to Islam as well, and then uh, <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so what is it, like a hundred camels you get a reward for? <laughs> to convert somebody? Yeah. So then over time is when uh, I started working with a bunch of people, and uh, they started bringing questions up about the religion. So I was trying to answer their questions, but then I started digging in, and I'm like, whoa, this rabbit hole goes deeper than than it looks. And uh, yeah, that's that's my story. But I'm still shocked because Pakistani madrasas, right? Like they are like very hard to go. Like I think the one you went to was by Mufti Taki Usmani. That one. Uh, no, so the one I went to was by Mufti Naim, his name is. Uh, okay. he, it's still there. It's actually, to be fair, it's actually, as far as madrasas go, obviously, I don't mean in and of itself, but if you're comparing them relatively, it's actually relatively very chilled, a, a nice, a chilled in a nice way, a nice chilled atmosphere. Um, and they... they it's it's like one of those last say fair they just you know hands off approach like they just let you get on with it there that said it definitely is still constrictive by my way of thinking now but i i'm, I'm speaking relatively with madrasas like mufti taki's madrasa for example mufti taki's madrasa i actually went there for uh to apply for iftar to do the mufti course um when i'd finished my alamia course and the only reason the only reason was because I loved their library. They had a brand new library made at that time. Now it's old, but it was like three stories and it was, you know, books, books, books. And I was thinking, this is amazing. I mean, now everything is, you know, you've got it right there and then. And but in that day and age, wanting to research things and and the library in Benoria, it was the Jami Benoria, but it was very restrictive. I used to buy my own books. But I saw their library and I was like, wow. I thought, if I study here, the, the, the amount of things I will unearth. <laughs> and I, I, have this, I have this tendency, which I still have for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> it's like I end up finding the most strangest of <laughs> I don't know whether it's a blessing or a curse. but uh, And so I thought, this would be awesome if I was here. Like, So I went there to apply and they, they humiliated the hell out of me. <laughs> 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 because because they felt that I was not appropriately dressed, they felt I was not appropriate. My, you know, it's like to them a propriety issue that I wasn't looking like my beard, even though it was like in that video that which is still on YouTube. Uh, but to them, that was unacceptable having a beard that wasn't full outgrown now. And I explained to them I'm Maliki and I think differently. And, and they were very rude, subhanAllah. I mean, um, I remember one of them kind of took my certificate and he threw it across the room. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I just looked at him and I thought, <laughs> oh, I, honestly, I felt like, oh my God, it, I, I, my blood boiled, honestly. I I couldn't believe he did that. He just, I, and he said like, what? Like, what do you want here, go? Like, we, we don't need you in this place. I thought, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, have some goddamn respect. I haven't come here to, you know, um, uh, I've come here to apply. I wasn't coming here to, and this was for the Mufti. I mean, so I was already a scholar by that stage. But yeah, so I wasn't at Mufti. So I'm just giving you a comparison that they were, relatively speaking, Mufti Naeem's uh, Jamia Benuria, which is still there. And it's now, uh, I recently met with his son, actually, he came here. And he's, they've done some great things with it. They've kind of made it, they've launched it as a secular kind of university as well. And But yeah, so I mean, my point of saying that was, um, it's not that relatively, relatively, of course. Of course, they still had issues, but <laughs> who, who doesn't? Who doesn't? <laughs> yeah. All right. So how do you, let's say, Mufti Abu Lais, like 10 years ago, looking at the Quran versus Mufti Abu Lais looking at the Quran now, you know, like reading, let's say, were you more of a literalist back then? And then you've changed, it seems like more towards naturalistic philosophy. I don't know if I, I definitely wasn't a literalist. Um, and I did, I was critical of a lot of issues then as well. But the, the point is a person is influenced by his environment. Mm -hmm. Now, there, were, there are many things that one will not question, not necessarily out of fear or out of, um, but just that they don't even come to the forefront of questioning. Like you don't even think of it as a question. You, it's until you're in an environment or somebody points it out to you or, and then you look into it. So at that time, I did used to question a lot, especially on fiqh issues rulings i was never too convinced with oh why so for example the beard i, I don't see that the fact that there isn't even one hadith of the prophet telling you that you have to grow a beard in a particular way i found that very, very shocking that people will accept it that these kind of examples i i questioned a lot but the greater questions of theology and things like that i guess i didn't um it was at that stage I didn't because it wasn't a, I wasn't in an environment that was kind of provoking that thought. So I was, it, to me, they, there's some things in life that are just a given and many things were a given. And then later on, I grappled with those issues as well as I came back, as I studied philosophy of religion, as I taught philosophy of religion, as I, um, you know, spoke with professors as I learned psychology and, and so greater questions came into play, questions of ethics, questions of, um, you know, morality at a deeper level. It's not that I, I didn't know these things before, but, but I, they weren't in the spotlight of scrutiny. So they were just a given. So I wasn't really uh, pondering. Yeah. All right. So uh, just an example, like for if you were reading the verses about, uh, like, let's say Jesus raising the dead 10 years ago versus now, or let's say verses about the, let's say you're reading Surah Jinn, you know, like the existence of jinns in itself. How would you have come from your old beliefs where you believe these things to be true, like evil eye, jinns and magic to where you are now, where you've already completely renounced like things like uh, black magic and evil eye? Yeah, I, I don't think I had at that stage denounced things like black magic and uh, evil eye and jinn possession. I was skeptical of them, though. But you see, these things tie into a deeper understanding of the faith. Now, you, you see, it begins by first of all questioning, and then it's to do with your ability to be able to find answers. Now, I, I have to say, I mean, many times, look, uh, uh, Abdullah I've been asked on many occasions that, look, why you, you know, like you seem to really speak for the primacy of reason. Why are you convinced about faith? Why do you feel that this is the way? Why do you, you know, why do you still believe? Why are you still a Muslim? These kind of things. Many people ask me, I mean, some atheist friends or other people through online, uh, they ask me these things. 
Now, I would say that, first of all, I'm really, I mean, I'm really grateful to, uh, I'm grateful, obviously, from a believer's perspective, I'm grateful to God that I have studied this theme for myself. Because that is just so important, not being dependent on the minds of other men. Because these people are pushing, many people are pushing an agenda. Religion, unfortunately, has become institutionalized. Uh, it's nothing new. It's been institutionalized for, for, you know, for centuries on end. But people are pushing their own thing. And not most people do not, especially within religion, unfortunately, the clergy, I mean. Uh, by that, I mean the clergy, not common Muslims or common believers. But the clergy are not often people of reason. They're, they're not a kind of, uh, philosoph you know, like a philosoph uh, philosophizing kind of people. They're not like that. And they, so if I was rendered uh, just a dependent on them, I would have probably disbelieved. I would have probably turned away from uh, Islam and felt that Islam doesn't have any answers. Uh, but because I study for myself and I sought answers, and alhamdulillah, I feel that, I'm not saying I found the answers to everything, but I, I feel that I found many answers along the way. But this, you know, it kind of ties into greater questions, Abdullah. I suppose this kind of brings... Uh, you into it as well and your kind of struggle that you see the question is that why does one believe okay why does one believe i would ask that it ties into a deeper human need to find meaning in this world like i mean we like if i was to ask for example like just bouncing that back at back at you, for example, what? How would you feel that there is meaning in this world? I mean, in all honesty, like I see the the, the search for meaning or the zeal for meaning in humans uh, as a subjective need. Like if you if you look around us, right? Like most of the universe that's out there that we've found out, it seems very yeah. pointless, right? And the more you dig deeper into the question, you realize that the, the, the search for meaning has a very good evolutionary uh, explanation behind it. Where, for, for example, if you have uh, a meaning attached to our lives, we will want to live more or live better lives or something, right? So I find, I find the search for meaning itself is a very subjective, and it's a human emotional need. It's not an objective thing. Like, yeah. and the thing okay, is, what, sure. But what, at a subjective level, because if you were to say, like, look, meaning makes us want to live better lives. I mean, what what, what would that mean, better lives? In, in the sense, like, if you have a goal you're aspiring towards, right, you'll work hard to achieve that goal. For example, somebody who wants to be, uh, his purpose in life is let's be nice to everybody around him, right? So he'll strive towards that goal. So for example, the, the concept of afterlife, if you want to talk about like, if you want to get to Jannah, then you'll take certain steps and take certain actions to get to that goal, even though you might not have any evidence for it. But even if it's an illusory purpose, it still helps you change your actions and make your actions around that purpose. That's what I feel. But like, let's say you, we say now we just take if we just unpack some some of some of that. So we say, look, a person wants to be nice to people around him. Um, you see, when we say wants to be nice, as in like, okay, wants to be kind, wants to be this, but we are unquestionably, as all creatures, driven by motivations, instinctual motivations that we have within us. Uh, those motivations, by and large, are very self-centered. So, yes, we don't mind being nice because, you know, one could argue from a Hobbesian perspective or other perspective, maybe we're trying to tie into a social contract or something. But does, you know, this whole thing, like, so if 
we're just trying to gain from people. So the only reason I'm being good is because I want other people to be good. Um, but really, it's so I, when I'm met by people, they're equally good to me. It's a very self-centered, very kind of um, uh, 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 almost like a selfish, um, not that there's anything wrong with it being selfish, but it's a very selfish kind of uh, goal. I mean, based on that, it's still like, so what is the, the meaning? So if there is, I mean, is there some meaning to this or is there no meaning to this? Do you feel this is? I think most people make their own meaning and purpose in life. Uh, I think there is no objective one purpose for everybody's life. I also mm -hmm. see that humans are, are, are narcissistic as a species. You know, everybody wants to survive and this need to survive and live on is, is embedded in us uh, in almost all life you see around us, right? And that's where we all yeah, come all, from. All life around us doesn't have consciousness the way we have consciousness. Well, I mean, I also study neuroscience too. If you want to get into consciousness, uh, uh, there's other animals that have a sense of self, you know, like apes do yes, wonderful course, things. Yeah. Like so what I'm, saying, so what I'm trying to say is like we assign an arbitrary importance to our consciousness and we want a meaning for our our conscious experience, but we are also not understanding this, this for example, the sense of self sense to apes, magpies, elephants, dolphins even have many much bigger brains, whales. These animals also have a sense of self, but we are okay with them not having a real meaning or just wandering around, you know. Or for example, if you want to go back further in time, like there's animals for eon, like dinosaurs ruled the earth for like 200 million no, years. We are okay with accepting just, them kind of just living. No, I'm not. You see, like there is a difference between, like if we take consciousness as a spectrum, uh, there is a difference between self-awareness, which many uh, animals have kind of through studies demonstrated that elephants, other things, primates, uh, we've got dolphins and, and other animals. The, the point is a higher level than other animals, I mean. But putting that aside, there's a consciousness in a reflective sense. Uh, the higher end of consciousness, which is very human, just all too human. Um, that is not by any analysis shared by other creatures around us. Hence, they're not ruling the world. Um, I mean, is it, do you feel consciousness, this thing is just meaning, like it has no story to it, it has nothing? I, I honestly nothing. feel, no, because like if you look at people's, I, I honestly feel like consciousness is intrinsically tied to the material brain. For example, if you see people with high spatial neglect, yeah, like if you see people with disorders like high spatial neglect, where they they would ignore half side of their body, but they'll still perceive it and stuff. They just like, for example, shave half their face or, <clears throat> sorry, if I mean, some, so people, people... some people would, uh, like if you damage a certain part of the brain, they lose, let's say their temporal lobe, they lose recognition of a distinction between vegetables or animals or stop recognizing faces. You damage one part, it becomes in a way that they can't speak language, perceive, they lose some memory. Uh, and there's this part in the brain called a claustrum. If you if you uh, fire a beam at it, right, you just literally become a vegetable. You'll still have your circadian cycles and everything, but you'll just won't be there, kind of like in a zombie state. So, I mean, I honestly feel it's a materialistic thing, and consciousness, the way it evolves in us, is, is a tool to help us survive. But in, its, in and of itself, if you look at the uh, I mean, if I just, like, like I was the, just going to yeah, sorry, yeah. Go no, yeah, sorry. So, what, what's the research? Like, it, they're almost at a level. They're almost about to quantify. They can put uh, graphs uh, where they can put awareness into different spectrums in in quantifiable numbers, and they can manipulate consciousness, conscious experiences, very, very. Uh, well now we're coming to an understanding where you can predict people's uh, movements so like up to seconds before or their thoughts uh, even you see before. i'm not you see no i'm not um denying that the brain is inextricably bound to the understanding of consciousness but is it a hard matter uh, I, like the thing that you spoke about, people that have had their, let's say, corpus collo uh, co uh, callosum, they've had that kind of severed and they now the split okay, brain yeah. kind of... 
uh, uh, scenarios in patients beginning right from the early 1900s through some of the uh, experiments and also surgery. And they have developed sometimes a split brain phenomenon um, with two different distinct personalities. But I'm not speaking so much about personality, but the consciousness with a capital C. You see, there has been, I accept there have been studies of neural correlates to consciousness, but they've not, are they simply a byproduct is something we cannot determine. In many ways, like let's say um, the, the eye, for example, yeah, because you said about brain lesions and brain damage. Now the eye, if the eye was damaged, you would lose sight, but it doesn't mean what the world you see is in here. The world you see is still out there. But if the eye became, if you had retinal damage or whatever it was, some of the neural optic nerves were damaged, uh, you would lose sight. But it doesn't mean that the world out there doesn't exist or it didn't exist. And some interesting research recently, in fact, I attended a conference just uh, a month before last. And uh, one of the leading ex, I mean, he is retired now. Uh, Vim Ponnell, I believe, Dr. Vim Ponnell, a leading cardiologist, award-winning cardiologist, um, who'd, who'd basically done a lot of studies on people um, that had uh, patients who'd undergone cardiac arrest. And usually they would be in hospitals and those who reported a near-death experience, or um, in this case, a, an actual death experience, they had flatlined. So looking at the graphs, and you can, I mean, you can buy his book and he's, he's got the whole, uh, the whole research put in there with all his studies. So he's, he surveyed several patients that did acknowledge to having this experience. And the heart, once it had been, once it had stopped beating for up to around, let's say, 20 seconds, the, the neural activity in the brain had shut down. It had completely shut down. Now, these people, and some in many cases, when a person is revived, let's say a minute later or up to two minutes later, it would still take up to two minutes for the neural activity to resume. Uh, and he shows all the electroencephalograms and he shows the, the, the ECGs as well to show where a person is flatlining and how the neural activity kind of completely almost flatlines. Now, those people having those experiences that they all relate, so they, they, they have this kind of sense of ease, this sense of floating vision, this light that they see, that they're going up. Now, what's interesting is the brain couldn't, generally speaking, from a psychological perspective, have been forming those memories if it was not active. Um, so the brain needs neural activity, needs to be firing neurotransmitters to be doing stuff. Now, when, the, when there is no neural activity and there seems to be these kind of visions that people are having, it very strongly suggests, obviously, a non-local consciousness. Perhaps we're, I mean, it raises big questions. I'm not saying it's concretized or solidified proof, but it was very interesting. I mean, this is scientific. It's not something, um, you know, just, just hearsay. But, I mean, what this... this well, this thing of like the fact that human beings have a strong need to this kind of like this to feel to, and I don't just mean feel as in sensory kind of feel but this what to reflect to kind of think to, to for stories for example human beings have an intrinsic need for stories um, do, does this just amount to it's just absolute i'm not saying they have to all the meanings have to be correct but it amounts to no meaning at all i mean like you brought up ndes right near death experiences and there's two sides to the story like you can do these experiments and you see these uh, that before rats die or we've measured this is they have a surge of activity right and this could be a way of brain trying to reboot itself in the last moments like a last ditch efforts for example when people say your whole life flashes in front of your eyes where seeing your whole life and your whole memories might give you more willpower to live on now using just ndes as as the only evidence uh, no, as no, 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 global, or like let's say yeah. one of the more more evidence that people cling on to who say that there is an afterlife and then looking at the other evidence that 
is very strong that goes for that propagates the materialistic view it's a very fringe argument to say that okay just because humans have this uh, this 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 near death experience therefore a soul might exist or that uh, somehow at after you damage all of the brain we already talked about if you damage one part of the brain you'll lose some faculties if you damage the other if you damage it to death, you're suddenly saying that you're going to detach from the brain with all your faculties intact, or is it? What are you propagating? Like, what kind of consciousness would it be? Would it be like a see, global? I, I don't, see, this is where I I don't act. To me, uh, in my understanding, consciousness is a rule. Um, I I kind of believe that, like from that Islamic pers perspective, that that is uh, what is referred to as rule. Now I. When when we're saying where is consciousness, how is consciousness? In my understanding, I w I do believe in a kind of um, a collective consciousness as well. That there is some uh, low level, albeit low level, but some kind of connection, um, that, and hence uh, these kind of beyond probability um, phenomena of things like when people have some kind of um, uh, it's not necessarily uh, telepathy in the sense we're having a full conversation, but some kind of reaction that's inexplicable. Uh, in psychology, what they call psi, uh, which is spelled PSI, psi, that behavior that doesn't demonstrate the normal causal patterns that science generally refers to. Psi. So, for example, a loved one being involved in an accident and you suddenly having a sense of anxiety and unease like well, some, something's wrong. Um, these things have been demonstrated, in fact, um, and, and they're very difficult. In fact, I attended a, a very, uh, a, an entire seminar just recently on parapsychology, where there was a lot of study into this, into this kind of uh, telepathic um, communication in this sense. I don't mean telepathy, and they did discuss the other ones as well, where they're trying to just say things, but this kind of where, you, you have a kind of uh, precognition or, or this sense of anxiety or fear, or you feel something. Um, another interesting study that was brought up as well was a distant brain correlation to people when they are very close to each other, either through, either through a relationship, loved ones, or family, that they were very close, they had a strong bond, um, scientific data showed when one of them in a particular place had a certain, uh, like they had a bright light sh uh, shown into in, into their eyes. I mean, not like blinding, right, but enough that there was a, sh obviously the neurons activated in their brain, but there was a shadow effect in the brains, not, not in that place, in a different place of the other participant, the loved one. Um, they call this distant brain correlation. I mean, it's it's just size so far. Like they can't really explain how two human beings become so intricately bound. I would feel that that is the the sense of collective consciousness. That it, the closer you are with someone, that from an Islamic term, if you if you want to use Islamic terms, the fact that al arwah junudum mujannada that the arwah are connected. Um, I mean that that's just I'm just saying on on things like. Um, it's it's interesting on consciousness that people human beings need they have an intrinsic need for things like stories i mean you would what religion does for people is it provides them a kind of story now it may you know in some ways uh, be a very simplistic, it may be a simple, it may even be a simplistic story in some cases. But it provides people a, a kind of uh, a support mechanism throughout this life in general. I mean, what would, it's unquestionable, unquestionable sociological and anthropological data shows that people who, for example, if they've undergone tragedy, if they have faith to lean in on, and they usually will be, uh, they will be cured or they will, I mean, if it's a curable or they will recover is a better word and recuperate much, uh, it will be more swift than somebody who had no, for example, strong faith mechanism to lean in on or didn't really have, 
I mean, this is if we're given the equal social measures as well. I don't mean, if you take two people that are equal, uh, I don't mean obviously one has all the medicine and the other one doesn't have all the medicine. I mean, if they're of equal stature, but one had a meaning that, uh, a story to give them some kind of strength, they definitely pull through that much stronger. Yeah, I no, mean, definitely. What, what I would say is like, there's different religions that have given people different stories that are completely mutually exclusive, right? So the problem is that you can give somebody a false sense of hope. And they might cling on to it. And then you can explain it neurologically how their amygdala might react differently. Instead of somebody fearing that they might be longing to meet God and the amygdala might not cause a stress response in the normal way, right? I don't want to get into too much detail, but the question sure. that I want to come to is like, if a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Christian, or let's say a guy is living in three, 4,000 years ago in the Egyptian civilization or Sumerians, they were having absurd, completely different stories to give meaning to. How does that objectively give any credence or, let's say, Islamic stories? Do you understand what I'm getting well, to? Yeah, I mean, you see, because the question, first of all, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, and I agree that these narratives are very different. Now, I would say it kind of stems from, first of all, to, to get into it, the gateway, is this understanding that there is something as opposed to nothing. Now, once a person, because I would say by, I would feel that it's almost inherent that human beings have that awareness that there is something um, rather than, not, I mean, it's. I'm not saying this is uh, right now an objectified, I'm just saying an inherent kind of experience that we have, experientially speaking, you know, that, uh, what's that? Um, <laughs> you know that that kind of like you have this understanding that look there's that there's something this kind of and then from there there is a search uh, and and I'm not saying the search has to um, definitively find a a very precise or it, that is the correct. But there would be a search that would have many faces to it, many manifestations. Now, a lot of, uh, there's been thousands of religions, if we want to call them religions or practices or, you know, hundreds of thousands, perhaps. Um, and people have had different stories, some often quite with similarities, like creation stories, different things throughout life, uh, which I feel in my sense, in my understanding, a lot of these things are, they contain what I call narratological truths, that they are not um, kind of like uh, truths necessarily in the sense they don't have to be truths in a uh, very descriptive uh, precision sense. It's not a kind of description, they're narratological truths. So by it's almost like an artistic truth. Yeah, similar to metaphorical truths, I guess. So... But, like, symbolic truths okay so for example let's let's bring it back to the quran right like the quran has a lot of stories now you're saying that most of these stories they conflict with reason so we can't take them let's say literally right and they're metaphorical uh, truths now if i look at the quran i see that this is the exact claim the kuffar made against the quran saying well, you were saying that their ancient story is mostly metaphorical. They were saying the same thing, and then Allah rebuked them. How is your position different from the Kuffar of Mecca just by saying that these are mere stories for metaphors? You see, I, I would say, well, first of all, it's it, it comes back to what are they saying this about? In here, la satirul that these are legends of the. Um, that what what exactly were they referring to uh, and who were the people that were saying these things because now a lot of research seems to be showing i mean i'm, I'm looking into this quite a lot recently i've been exploring this whole um, um you know it's been a, a bit of a project ongoing project looking into um the claims uh, of Islam revisionists and then re-examining a lot of data. And it appears that the people that the Prophet وسلم, may have been speaking to often or may have been debating with, or if, if we use that word debating or, or having a dialogue with, 
may not have been uh, just the simple pagans that were easily portrayed before. It seems that they were most likely people from the northern kingdoms, the northern Arabian kingdoms from either Ghassan, which was Byzantine, uh, part of the Byzantine, it was an affiliate. Uh, they were Arab kingdoms in the Middle East today, and they were mainly Christian. And uh, all, all from the Persian Sassanid side, where you had the Lahmids. Now, these people, th there, were, there were quite a few Jewish settlements there as well. It seems to be now that there were a lot more, a much, a very heavy Christian and Jewish presence um, in the Arabian diaspora, not just the Arabian Peninsula amongst Arabs than we assumed. It seems to be a much greater, I mean, a heavy, heavy. And it seems that polytheism in the absolute idolatry sense, I don't mean in just shirki practices, but in the kind of real sense of just statues and just a bit like the way, let's say, Hinduism today is today. It seems that that may have been restricted to just the hijabs. It seems, and maybe some pockets elsewhere, but the rest of the Arabian Peninsula, because the south, the Aksumite kingdoms were heavily Christian, the north were pretty much all Christian and Jewish settlements, the south had Jewish uh, settlements, you know, from some of the kings were Jews uh, in the southern Hemir kind of kingdoms. So it seems that it's very likely that because the Prophet was claiming to, to, the, to the Arabs of Mecca to be from a lineage of these prophets, the so-called, if we can call them like the biblical kind of prophets, like stories of Moses and stories of, let's say, Adam and Noah, uh, that the people of Mecca would have brought biblical specialists to debate him. It's There's very a like story of uh, another uh, bin al Haris, right? Like where he went to Persia, studied, and then came back to Mecca. And it says in the tafsir that this verse, uh, this specific verse was referring to him because when Muhammad would tell these stories to people, he would say, hey, his stories are just like any other stories. I can tell you better ones from the Persians and all those kingdoms, right? So coming back to the point is... I, mean, that, that's not, I don't think that's an authentic uh, narration, but and also this Asatir al-Awwaleen comes in many places in the Quran. It comes countless places. Um, but yes, carrying on. So I think the issue is, look, the issue is this, that when it comes to, uh, let's say we, and, and this is a problem I, I face with obviously many, let's say, um, the clergy or other kind of, especially, you know, sectarian kind of uh, followings, is that they, some people do interpret things very literally, which to me don't make sense. Uh, I do feel that they were never meant to be, certain things were never meant to, certain things may have been symbolic. They may have been metaphoric. They may have been just dramatized as a story kind of personified to give uh, a greater lesson because by and large people learn through stories like people oh, definitely but that's just a medium that people use to teach other people but what i'm trying to say the quran projects yeah. stories as being actual events right for example the story of moses or uh the story yeah. of Abul Fil, or let's say they're very specific ones like jesus raising people from the dead it says he did this miracle, right? Do you believe those to be literal or do you believe to be just metaphors? No, because look, first of all, th these stories, uh, like let's say Moses, Jesus, Noah, all these people, I don't, I, I'm not saying, what I'm not saying, and then I'll come to what I am saying. What I'm not saying is that these stories in and of themselves are just metaphors concocted. So like, God said, for example, I know, let's teach people a lesson about gratitude. So I'm going to invent, there was a character called, um, I'm not saying that. I mean, some people may say that, but these are just fictitious, uh, fictive figures. I, I don't believe, I believe that there are, this is when I was saying that there's narratological truths as opposed to just metaphorical truths. Um, what I mean is that it's a, a kind of concoction of, of an event, but part of it may be kind of further personified, further dramatized, further uh, okay. for simplification. Part of it may be real. It's not 
a um, it's how humans would tell events to other humans after time i mean i don't mean as you're describing it as it's happening but if you were trying to tell somebody something you know generations later oh there was this great person and this and this now mm. that's what i mean so when it comes to now coming to uh jesus or moses i i believe that many of the the things were actual events they were like when um, by moses i mean the actual exodus and things like this and there's been archaeological findings to to demonstrate that uh but like with jesus when it comes to miracles what do we believe about miracles now i believe that what we term miracles um like i, I like any human being i i use this word miracle but i don't believe it's something that kind of defies the laws of nature i don't believe that uh, miracles are things which go against god's own laws of nature i believe that they are um part and parcel of this kind of illustrious thing that we call life so um so when we say things like jesus raising people from the dead i don't believe that he raised people from the dead like that because even if you look at the bible it's only two account, two accounts there's lazarus and there's a little girl there's not jesus doesn't go around raising people from the dead okay. he doesn't kind of say hey, well, you come out of the dead you come out so, of the dead so, so so that's one one type of story right then uh, what about if so if, i mean what is so some people have said what is this referring to then because by the way i mean according to 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 the gospels i mean just saying for a moment uh you know after the the crucifixion you have the the whole of uh you know kind of you, you have so many people coming out of the dead and walking around and things like this but so people but that's the gospels i mean we're not bound by them necessarily in this discussion but what does this mean then that you raise people from the dead yes there are many muslims that have taken it literally to say oh maybe he raised people from the actual dead um i don't go by that understanding there's other people that uh, that say that what this meant was that they weren't actually dead and that they they weren't like brain dead or things like this but perceptively maybe they appeared dead and but here's and the problem version, sorry to okay, and the final and just the the final one is okay. that people said that this dead was metaphoric referring to the spirit of the law that the jewish people had killed that he brought it back to life he says well it hilla lakum ba'd alladhi harrama alaykum that you guys had turned this you dropped the soul of the faith and what jesus was doing was restoring life to that tradition so that's also a very um interesting kind of understanding that Yeah. like the so the issue here is like the quran or any of these books don't tell us what part we should understand in let's say more naturalistic sense and what part is exaggerated so in all essence at the end of the day it becomes like a very subjective exercise where you are understanding this something completely different and let's say if you look at classical islamic scholarship like tabari or ibn kathir or these great uh, these great exegetes they understood it absolutely differently than yours right so what in the end so, I mean, it comes yeah. back to the quran seems like just another book recounting stories like so, other so, I mean, like, if, if we just take some of some of what you said there and just 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 take a look at that for a moment like first of all none of these great mufassirin that you've mentioned uh existed in the early as in the salaf period they did like so even tabari we're talking he passes away in 311 hijri yeah. so uh, you know 300 years after the prophet and his tafsir is not it's just because he does it with chains of hadith and things like this that people have given it this primacy it's not a detailed kind of tafsir in the sense that later mufassirin go into detailing um but even people like ibn kathir you're already talking over 6 to 700 years after the prophet these people and ibn kathir tafsir is a very simple tafsir as well it's just kind of explaining stories but yes they may have believed i'm not here arguing that um that what did tabari believe for example what did ibn kathir believe what did qurtubi believe what did these kind of people believe i i you know to me 
fine, I, I will read what these people say, but we are not bound by the understandings of certain people who are bound by their own environment. Now, you're coming to the point, which is a, a more interesting point, that you're saying that, look, well, but then the Quran isn't explaining which where we're meant to understand this metaphorically, where we're meant to understand this symbolically or literally, and how do you... Now, I, I have a... Um, uh, a, a proposition that I've presented to people that what I call uh, using the term superpositions, right? So I feel like in quantum mechanics, I feel that in many ways the Quran is interacting with people as, as a kind of scripture. People in their lives at different times may be in these kind of superpositions where they, how does that relate to them? they may extract a certain meaning from it and draw some kind of strength from it, or they may understand it differently. I don't feel that that was the purpose. Like, let me let me give you an example, because what, what this boils down to is we're saying, in essence, it's a contradiction. Uh, because if we further reduce that statement, we're saying, look, this is a contradiction. Here you want to go literally, here you want to go. But what I'm trying to say is that is exactly, that's not, I mean, you can try and call it, you can call it a contradiction, if you like, from that respect. But what you're describing is just human beings and human dynamism. So let me, let me give you an example. Like, let's say, like, let's say, for example, like, would you, like, you would definitely agree that human beings, like we said earlier on in the discussion, should try to be better people. You, you would agree with me on, on that unquestionably. Is that, is, is, is that, that, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, sorry, what was your question, the last segment again? You, you would definitely agree, like, human beings should try to be better people. Yeah, definitely, and it's objective then, yeah. yeah. Now, but, but, if I was to ask you, for example, uh, we unquestionably are against killing. We Generally, I'm just saying, we are against killing, and, uh, you know, all decent human beings are. Uh, but if I asked you, what about the killing of animals for meat? I don't know if you're a vegetarian. Are you a vegetarian? No, I'm not. So would you feel it's okay then to kill animals just to eat them? I actually I have a couple. Like, if you want to go into morality right now, it would be a different discussion where I can say, okay, well, we have our axioms and our, the way we assign morality is arbitrary. We can also go into arguments for like how the yeah, brain develops. Is that not the very same contradiction? I, look, it's not words. No, no, no. I, can I understand where you're coming story. from, but... The point is, like, if the Quran is just giving you stories to interpret for everybody no, out there, if, given you're, time. if you're saying, let's say you a very rational person uh, who critiques things as a human being who lives by a code, feels that it's wrong to kill, but it's OK to kill living things too, so long as you eat them. Um, yeah, but, but then again, you can argue that plants are living things too, right? So, uh, would you be okay with, with killing? You say, so, so that, that is that not a, I'm just saying, like, saying it's okay to kill animals. Animals have a level of consciousness, um, which I'm not saying some trees and things may have some low level of con consciousness as well, but the way animals do, uh, would you, but you, we're quite comfortable saying, look, it's okay to kill an animal, uh, even though the animal has. Uh, sentience. I mean, it, it can feel, it, you know, it definitely feels pain. Um, yeah, what's the you can't say the same. So the point is that, you see, the very thing that the code that you're trying to adhere by, by saying, let's say, we like here, but is this not like if you're saying this is literal and this is, that's just human. That's how human beings okay. operate. Okay, but then how is the Quran unique from any other book? If every, if every book can be interpreted with this much flexibility and then be assigned arbitrary value, like the Qur'an has been given, what I'm just unique said a moment, Sure, but look, a moment ago, if we just take your simple code of a simple code, a uh, morality code, right, that, that you would, you'd be able to, like, you'd be the best judge of your own morality code. You'd know it better than anybody. And I've asked, let's say, a simple question like, how, how do, is that not a great discrepancy that you have? Yeah, but I don't adhere to objective morality anyways. Like, I've always been in... So, 
So, no, but to you, I don't mean objective morality. But to How you, does that relate to the Quran being true or not? I'm confused right now. No, it's truth is a different. We'll come to truth in just a moment. But right now we're, we're discussing the kind of what you said, the arbitrary nature, the arbitrary relativism of scripture to an individual. Now, I explain that an individual is dynamic. A human being has so dynamism. Every scripture life. relates to every person differently. That's what you're saying. So everybody so should be allowed what I'm to. Saying is that there is a necessary, if human beings are dynamic, there is a necessary, there must be dynamism for the script, for the scripture to, to kind of, to, to, to be able to be embraced. That's what I'm saying. Like, and, and I'm just relating it back to the example of saying, well, look, you are obviously very reason based. We could take a very simple, like your actual, your morality. I don't mean objective morality, your morality. And you find all of a sudden on a simple point, like if I was to say, well, what do you have to say about this? Uh, you would find like, and I could like, let's say you had said to me, let's say you had said to me, I am a vegan. I am a vegan. Let's say you'd said that. Okay. So uh, now I would have asked you a question and I'd like to ask that question. Since our, and this is the thing you see, like I know um, what it's like Sam Harris speaks about in his moral landscape as well, the whole thing. You see, if we are trying to prevent suffering, if that is something good that we ought to do, uh, and by some extension, that is the purpose of also deconstructing religion as well, presumably, that to, to prevent suffering. Now, I, I would ask that, look, like one, okay, like I asked the question that do you feel it's okay to eat animals? And in this, in this case, you do feel it's okay, but let's say you didn't feel it's okay. Or if somebody said, no, I don't eat animals, I'm a vegetarian or I'm a vegan. I would ask an interesting question that, you know, what about animals that hunt other animals? Like, let's say a lion hunting a gazelle, but it's in our capacity to prevent the gazelle from being killed, should we prevent it from its suffering? Why was it? I don't still get the tying this into how religion is going to prevent suffering and the Quran being God's word. No, because we're going on a moral, moral tangent. No, because and the question is. The question is all about, because first of all, if we're speaking about suffering, we have to understand what we're talking about. So to Sorry. say that, how we just to get, take, take a step back. OK, so you're saying religious morality's purpose is to reduce human. No, suffering. no, 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 no. I've said that morality by and large, generally, everybody you would agree with me. Morality is to prevent suffering. That is everybody one of has different axioms and that's a different sure, discussion. Sure, sure. But sure, but we agree on the definition that it is to prevent suffering. Now we may disagree what suffering means. Well, but like there, there's a thing, right? Like some people are you like they want to prevent suffering for animals. I mean, this is what, so, it to humans and stuff. That, that, so that's for totally example, different. But the point here is that I agree. I agree. And the point here is this is even in the moral landscape or in other kind of things that one of the those who argue that, for example. Uh, let's say science or whatever, or just actual objective study could lead us to some understanding of morality. Um, they would argue that, okay, how do we know what morality is? They would begin from the point of preventing suffering. That, and then you could extrapolate and build on and add all this kind of corpus to what does that exactly mean? And my point of saying that was that to demonstrate that, look, even in the, that, the big, that how arbitrary people are in placing their own personal codes. Like even like you're a very reason-based individual. But if I was to ask that, where would you place this, this code of morality of yours? You probably wouldn't be sure. Like, I mean, most people, if I said, okay, would you eat animals? Some people might say, yes, I'll prevent it there. But if I was to ask the question, should we save the gazelle from being hunted by the lion? Um, and thereby prevented suffering, but caused the lion to suffer by not eating food then, uh, should we still intervene? Because we, if we have the capacity, I understand in the wild where we don't have the capacity, but what about where we do have the capacity? Do we feel it's a moral obligation to intervene? And if not, 
then is that not a contradiction? No, no, I understand what you're trying to say, but what what I'm getting to is, uh, let me rephrase your point. You're saying because humans are so dynamic and diverse, the book God would send would be dynamic and diverse to appeal no, to different I'm trying people. To say to that, no, I'm trying to say that human beings, human beings are so full of contradictions. Yeah, so yeah. Full. So the, the issue is that we as, as entities of contradictions are trying to critique or trying to seek out perfection in something, which... I think is is unattainable because we ourselves are so full of contradictions. Okay. Uh, now coming to so the, how, how does it relate to the Quran? Because the Quran isn't a okay, human word so, according to you, right? It should be perfect in a way. Right, but okay, now coming to this thing about the Quran, and then we'll come on to truths like you like you asked a moment ago. You see, the Quran, first of all, we have today a picture of the Quran. Uh, that is presented by many Muslims today. There's nothing to say that this picture, so this picture of the Quran, let me describe this picture to you. It's that this book is, um, this. apart from it being a divine, this is a divine book, fine, uh, but they will say this is a miracle. The Quran is a miracle, they will say. Um, you, and, you, and they may elaborate on how, what, what is the miracle of it. So they may say it's, part of its miracle is its language. For example, this is commonly found. A lot of Muslims will say the miracle aspect of, Arab, uh, of the Quran is its Arabic. Some people will say the miracle aspects of the Quran is uh, it, its ability to, I don't know, have predicted certain events. And some people will say scientific knowledge. And some people will say all these other things. Now. I, I, what I'm saying is if you look at the actual Quran and the actual time of the Prophet through general authentic um, understandings, I don't feel, I don't feel that the Quran ever made these, uh, these claims in that sense. The Quran, if we're to describe it as a miracle, I do use the term miracle in day-to-day -day life as well. I mean, you, I, I gave the example of saying uh, to, 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 uh, in one of my discussions of saying, um, if I was running late, really late for, I had to get somewhere and I was really late and it was so urgent. But that day, as I drove, every traffic light was green, every, you know, I, I got there just before time. Like to me, that personally speaking, is a miracle. It would have never normally happened. Um, but it's not a miracle in the epic proportion of poor people. Like, but so in this sense, I'm just kind of showing that we use the term miracle. That's why I gave that example to, to, to mean a real event. I don't mean it has to be something where, you know, the hand of God is coming into earth and things like this. So the Quran is a miracle in the sense of what it would do. You see, people by and large need, when I said earlier on that people by and large need meaning, people need like concepts. To people, I suppose it's the concept of the book, of having a sacred book that has driven them. It's, uh, you no, know, it's like Tim Sorry? That's just an argument from influence that if a book can influence certain people to do certain amount of good or bad, that doesn't make the book true or not. That's just an argument. No, right, okay, no. Well, yeah, I'm going to come to the truth claim in a moment. So just speaking about what is the miraculous nature of it, um, of what it mobilized, it mobilized people to become this being, this becoming, this unfolding. I mean, it, unquestionably, unquestionably, the backbone of Islam has been as a book, the Quran. I don't mean the, like this particular surah, this particular verse. Most Muslims have probably never ever read the Quran from cover to cover with meaning throughout their lives. Um, but it's as a book, you know, ذلك kitab. As a kitab, it has served as the kind of mobilizing force on the back, which has, which is evident in history what it's actually, uh, you know, I mean, you've had huge, huge, 
I, I don't just mean from a civilization perspective, but even from a humanity perspective and human beings, what it's done to them is no short of a miracle. Um, I, I would I would argue against it because this is just an argument from influence, right? It's argument at popular where the Quran's effect on people in a way has been so immense that it that is a miracle so, but if you counteract the claim look at other books like the hindu books they they have built civilizations yeah. and other mythology but they, haven't, but they haven't like so if we take the rig vedas for example or we take the other they haven't one could argue about the bible to some extent but or the or the jewish uh kind of bible as well but the the rig vedas and other traditions which have had you know like thousands and thousands of uh, writings haven't served as that force as a book and that's what i mean because they're not they're too big to be a book i mean you could say the bhagavad gita but that came like much later right? i mean so that's one thing, to reveal as a book right that's one thing to do yeah exactly it wasn't i mean i mean i, I suppose they may feel that the shri or the rishis kind of uh, were inspired or whatever but the point that's not the the discussion. The point is that what it's carried off, what it's meant for people as a meaning, without even having pondered over the whole thing, is no okay. short of a miracle. One, but one question that I've been really wanting to ask is, who had yeah. the best and the most accurate understanding of the Quran according to you? Was it the Prophet, his Sahaba, the Tabi'een? Was it certain scholars? Who was it? You see, obviously, by necessity, we would feel that the, the Prophet had the, the best understanding of the Qur'an. However, the Qur'an by its nature describes itself to be um, mysterious in some aspects. Because, And one may question why, the, why some mystery. It's not all mysterious, but most isn't mysterious, but it has some mysterious elements in between punctuated mystery, if you like, throughout the scripture. And I would feel that that is, once again, because it resonates with human mystery. Uh, but I want to come to the, the important question you asked about truths, that what makes this true? Uh, you see, this comes back to an interesting question of what do we mean by truths? Like, what would you mean by truths? I mean, I'm talking about objective claims of reality. Like, for example, let's say if the Quran says jinns exist, okay, is is that an objective claim about something being yeah. real or not? Like, what what I'm see what what we're doing is we're taking a dynamic project, let's say the Quran, and we're taking human beings who are uber dynamic. And we are then saying, okay, what we're going to do is evaluate this through the prism of, uh, of objectivity, like we're saying now, in an empirical sense, like the way laboratory kind of objectives, which can be done and has been done. And there's no, that's, that's, that's unquestionable. People can use an empiricist prism. But I want to ask you, is that how human beings view life? Because let, let, let's because truth, for example, what is 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 art true? Does it have any truth? No, you're going into like uh, art, let's, language, let's, and beauty. No, no, let's use, no, let's use quantifiable data. Let's use, for example, art as it's sold. It has a price. So, for example, a Picasso or a Van Gogh. Um, what makes a particular painting? Uh, a particular painting of Picasso worth 150 million compared to, let's say, one of Pollock's, which may be 50 million. It's now, that is arbitrary. quantifiable. No, it's but it's quantifiable. Is it's it a, nonsense? Quantifiable doesn't mean necessarily that it is objectively, it's, it can but be it sold at this, this price no, and that price. Certain have, have, for example, uh, let me give you one idea. If one person from Africa might see the, the Picasso painting at like a hundred million. He's like, yeah. I don't think it's worth a hundred million. It should be worth ten million or ten thousand or one thousand. No, but 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 the art industry would agree roughly on its value in let's say that it cannot be sold under fifty million. 
But the composition, what you're saying, the art industry itself is a subjective, arbitrary. Like you're, okay, you're there assigning but, value to beauty patterns that we perceive. So, so, so it's so it's not true. They claim the price of the painting isn't isn't any in any sense like objectively so that say, it can't be any other price. No, so let's say no, so Van Gogh's. Uh, Let me bring this painting. Back it's not away. worth. Is that is it a false claim that it's not worth? Beauty the... is subjective. I some it's people. Not about beauty. It's, it's not about beautiful. In fact, Pollock's paintings have been described as vomiting. They've been as described as somebody. They've been described as disgusting. Pollock's paintings. Yeah. You'll find one of one of them easily priced. I mean, at least uh, like fifty million. They'll go up to one hundred fifty million. It's not about beauty. I'm asking when they when it's made when it has a claim that it's being sold for. Let's say this is the value of this. Is that a false claim? If I asked you, true or false? Are you saying like the price itself being a certain assigned a certain no, number? No, I'm, I'm speaking about I'm speaking about tr truth claims on value. So they're saying this is valued at fifty million. Is that true or false? They can assign any value to it. I'm not understanding. No, you like what you like what we're it's seeing argument from beauty right now no because you've realized that this is not about empiricism you see like if what, i understand that the question what we're doing is we're taking human beings who are for example bring it back to the quran yeah, but why is it, like if you take let's say you take music as an example uh, you can uh, apply value to it that people would agree that Beethoven or whatever, that these things are of great value. I mean, if you're looking at it empirically, it is simply sound waves and vibrations. Uh, yeah. But human beings don't see music as just sound waves and vibrations. Yeah. When somebody says a certain music track is, let's say, beautiful, it's a subjective yeah. claim to say that that thing is beautiful. It's not an objective claim. Yeah, but beautiful. Let's say millions of people... Yes, well, but so millions of people are, but is, let's say, millions of people find a particular uh, brand of music to be amazing, wonderful. Uh, I'm not, I accept it's subjective, I accept that it's to do with taste. But what we also accept is that this is not being viewed as simple sound waves and vibrations. No, 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 that's not no, what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say so the perception because, of beauty by some people is different amongst different but even people. Those, example, I'll bring it back to the Quran here. Yeah. Uh, some people say that the Quran has beautiful Arabic, okay? Well, sure. I'll say, okay, some places it does have beautiful Arabic, some places it doesn't. Some places it sounds very similar to pre Islam poetry, some places so, it's so, so, very ineloquent, right? So the point is, like, this whole argument you're trying to make see, it's, no, because very, it, it's actually very relevant because you see what we're doing is about the miracle aspect of the quran i already explained that i don't believe the quran is claiming to be these miracles that people have later claimed that it was but what i'm saying coming to this point why this is relevant is because you're taking when when you say is is so do you feel how, what makes the quran true i'm asking what does truth mean because if you're saying truth means what can be measured using a ruler, then okay, but that's, but then. I never claim to be an empiricist though either. I yeah, never. So, no, so what I'm saying is that human beings in their day to day lives, the majority of the things we see. So let's say, look, let's take an example. Uh, we are simply, in essence, everything, matter is just energy, in essence. I mean, even if we're looking at the subatomic world, we are just. You know, you've got all these forces, nuclear forces, we've got gluons, photons everywhere, things like this, which is undeniable, but we don't see the world in that way. No, no, no. Well, I'm, okay, let's bring this back to the Quran. Why do you think the Quran is the word of God, your strongest argument? No, because my point isn't that. My point is, you see, that translates as, obviously, this is a matter of faith. I accept the Quran. Now, the question is, why do you accept it to be true? Now, it depends on what truth. What do we mean by truth? If you mean by truth, I want it measured, I, I want it quantified, then human beings don't see their day-to-day -day lives in that sense. The vast majority of what we do, we do not see it in that way. 
We don't go around um, most of the things we assign value to. Like, let's take relationships as an example. But uh, no, no, like, this I, is, I wanna, I wanna, there's I wanna, a problem I here. I would it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's, it's going to come I back. I understand to your point completely. The like, point so you're let's, making. Let's say, is our human rights true? Of course, they're arbitrary and subjective. I totally understand this. They don't, I understand so your points right now. So, what I'm asking you is, why do you think the Quran is unique in a way that it can only have come from a god? Right, now, this is a matter of faith. Right, okay. so this is a matter of faith. Now, I accept that I do believe that there is this, to me, there is something rather than nothing. That then, like as I said, it takes you into a realm of a search. Now, you believe in things. We as human beings, we construct our world. I mean, we're living in a postmodern society. We're not living in a very classical worldview in the sense that human beings today are constructive. We accept that. Psychologists accept that. I mean, uh, a lot of, you know, many of these, Brunner, Brunner, all these other people, you can check their works and studies we are constructing our worldview as we're going along. Um, when we say, why, why the Quran, or, or to some people, why the Bible? It provides them some meaning. Now, you may say, well, you know, it doesn't really do it because it doesn't make sense. I could ask you any, I could ask you, why does the institution of marriage provide any meaning? No, I understand, but these are very basic moral conundrums that, and the point no, you're bringing that's up. Not moral, that's not a moral question. That's not no, a moral question. These are question. all like, these are, you're the appealing to social constructs. Is not a moral question. No, no, you're, you're appealing to social questions. constructs. You're appealing to yeah, social why, constructs and why, making why the argument you? that certain books or certain stories sure, appeal to like, certain I'm people. Asking, we're going to be able to relate this. This is why I'd like to unpack it slightly. That look, if we take the, the institution of marriage as an example, uh, it's not a moral question. I mean, it could tie into morality, but it's not a necessarily, it's a psychosocial uh, exploration, really. The, why the institution of marriage? What, 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 does it make sense? Does it actually make sense? Does it, does it, uh, do you feel no, that the institution of marriage... Is you don't need to be married. You can be in a common law relationship. You can be polyamorous. Whatever works for people. No, no, no. no the time well, and there well, needs to I, yes i'm not no i'm not speaking about what can you be i'm not speaking about can you be you anybody can be whatever they like from an but I'm saying, perspective, you're, you're looking at all of these claims from a functional structuralist approach no because no i'm no not at all i'm trying to tell you that these things don't actually exist of they course only, i understand that they only exist because we've allowed them to exist in our mind, psychosocial entities. Okay. Okay. In fact, no, no, no. by and That's large, look, human, beings, human beings, the reason I was speaking about relationships is because by and large, human beings can do whatever they want, but by and large, in societies, you can name it what you like, but they believe in an institution. Whether you want to call it a marriage, which still by and large is the majority of mankind, or you want to just call it we're mutually exclusive to each other. We're just girlfriend, boyfriend, but mutually exclusive. That is by and large most relationships. I Almost, and th there is a uh, proprietorial claim, a kind of a, a claim of possession, of ownership of each other, a co-joint ownership. I want to ask what people believing in that. Why? Like, how, how does this... It serves like, a functional, functional, structural uh, purpose in society, and that's why they believe in it. And you're trying I mean, to make well, this argument for could, religion as well, because yeah, religion because, no, the purpose. Yeah, of course, of course. But the question here is that, you see, when we say, I, I understand we're going to say it has a function, by and large, it goes against the function, the, against the actual instincts that we have as creatures generally. Uh, it goes against, defies our instincts. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't say it's true. We couldn't ascribe a truth value to, uh, and we could even ask people, why do you do it? Look like if you believe this world amounts to nothing, let's say, like, let's say I momentarily accept that, then why am I denying myself self-gratification 
which has been the, the number one, like what people on palliative care, when their studies have been done, when people are about to die due to terminal illnesses, and some of the greatest regrets that people have had throughout their lifetimes was denying themselves. You know, that, that they've... Now, if a, a human being is to deny himself or herself uh, and believe in some kind of institution that doesn't really have any... What, what, what is it? Where is it? What is this? Uh, is that, I mean, one, one, and we can't even say it's true. We can't even ascribe a truth value to it. And yet we compromise because we find some compromised meaning, which is compromised. Would you say people don't find a similar compromised meaning, uh, if not uh, at the very least compromised, but they find a meaning in religious scripture? Of course they do. Yeah, and I totally understand your point. So you said that you cannot prove categorically or objectively the Quran to be the word of God, but it's a matter of faith. And it gives you meaning and gives a lot of other people meaning. Therefore, to them, them it, it serves a functional, structural purpose in their life. Therefore, they can accept the Quran as the word of God. Now, the problem is, like, you also agree in many, many ways where the Quran will, let's say, endorse slavery, right? You've lost that purpose and structure of slavery in today's society completely and i've seen like you've claimed in your video for example saying that slavery is kidnap and rape but the quran endorses it okay and there's hadith where it's saying that the, the sahaba went to like i think Banu Mustalik, where they captured women and then they, the wording in muslim and etc like we found some beautiful arab women and we had been away from our wives and then we took them into our custody and we did what we did we asked the messenger can we do quietus interrupt us so they don't get pregnant so we can resell them what I'm trying to get back to is the Quran has a lot of things that are bound to the seventh century. Okay, so that's good. Like there's a, a lot, lot of things here. can be discarded, right? You see, because a lot of there's a lot of things here. I'd like to unpack some of them. Um, the the what's being said. So we're saying that look, okay, we understand that this provides great meaning to people. We understand that it uh, gives people a strength to persevere throughout their lives. We understand that they take. Uh, some kind of nourishment from scripture. But we, we're understanding that there's some things that don't fit in or there's some issues. But I similarly asked you a moment ago about many things in your life that you are, or many people, and not to make it personal, but like many people in their lives are going about day to day, like, like let's say we accepted this psychosocial construct of things like marriage, the psychosocial construct of things like money, the psychosocial construct, I mean, these things have not, like, if I was to ask you uh, the psychosocial construct of possession in and of itself, now, to possess anything, what makes anything allowed to be possessed? Now, if we're saying that, look, we in our day-to-day -day lives exist, go about our day-to-day -day lives, seeing that, look, we, at times, we, we interpret this aspect differently. So, look, I'm in an institution of marriage. I'm denying myself all these other women. But I'm, and I see that as a contradiction, let's say, as an individual. And I may, at times, interpret that in a particular way. Or I may feel that, oh, I'm somehow responsible for another person when I ought to be free as God or as I was born, even if I don't believe in God, let's say I was born free, yet I'm kind of, you know, here I'm trapped in these kind of man-made mental institutions. Um, and if I'm prepared to interpret things and they don't, they don't interfere with, my, with me getting on in life, I, I feel in many ways Muslims would do the same. I mean, any human being would do the same that they would see certain things like, first of all, I don't feel, I don't feel, and I'll come to myself uh, in a moment, I don't feel most Muslims, like I said, have really ever pondered about the Quran or about the details or finites of Islam in that detail. <laughs> Generally speaking, most Muslims would probably be quite uh, unaware of a lot of, you know, a lot of whether it's actual history or whether it's actual things or whatever it is. And when they have a question put at them, they have to then think about it. I think the the problem this creates as well is it makes people unnecessarily become defensive because they think, oh, the religion's being questioned. 
and then they end up defending something which ought not be defended. Uh, slavery is a good example. I don't, you see, in my reading of the Quran, I don't believe the Quran in any way came to encourage slavery. Um, I don't believe in my reading. I believe that the Quran did acknowledge that it was a practice. Um, they even now, actually mentions it as a sign of the believing men and uh, men in Surah Mu'minun, where it mentions next to Salah that there and Li Farujim half his own illa ala. Uh, oh, yeah, but that's not talking about. I'm talking about the concept of enslaving. I'm talking about the concept of enslaving. That Islam seems to, in my reading of the scripture, it seems to uh, acknowledge that it's pr it's present, it's ubiquitous, it's widespread, and it's part and parcel of the daily lives. It doesn't seem to be speaking like gloating about it or speaking that encouraging or trying to say you get out there and you know make take the world well, over. And say, like in, in Surah Ahza, where it goes out of the way to tell the Prophet that you are allowed to marry more than four wives. There's an exception for you and any of those from what you're right. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. Although I do believe personally that there is no restriction on four, but I don't uh, believe that there's any verse that says to the prophet that you are allowed to go beyond four because then this debate wouldn't exist in the Sharia of whether it was restricted to four or not. Or uh, I, In my understanding, I feel that there was no restriction ever on the polygamous kind of marriages. And just the, the verses that are used, Mathna wa thulatha wa ruba, do not actually say thintain wa thalath. Wa, it doesn't say, you know, in twos or threes, it, as in two wives, three wives. It says in multiplicity. And hence, Imam Shaukani and these people argued for that. But that's a different on polygamy and societies. But my point here is in saying that I, you see, in my reading, I, I wouldn't believe that that's true, that it's encouraging because it's often speaking of freeing slaves. Now, it depends how you read things. I would feel that Islam came with a trajectory hermeneutics, that it came that when the time would change, that these things would become forbidden. Um, and as they were deemed by many ulama, there's, there's a yeah. subtle point to be made here, and it's very important, where the Quran doesn't provide a framework within itself that tells you, oh, from a thousand years from now, or when this happens, you discard this punishment and keep this one, or take this one and throw that one out. So you're already depending on scholars external to the Quran, which in itself is, again, a subjective exercise. So I want to ask a question. Are you a moral relativist, or do you adhere to like the Quran being morally objective and then extrapolate? So in my understanding, human ethics, or if we want to call it human ethics, uh, would always continue to develop with the human, with the growth of human consciousness, the collective consciousness. As it kind of grows, the day and age and the rulings would reflect that. Uh, now, you see, I think it's an important point you made and it needs to be addressed that, look, because the Quran doesn't highlight this, uh, you feel that, like, a thousand years later, you're kind of left to your own devices. But I would say, isn't that story just all just human or too human? Because a moment ago when I asked you about, let's say, general moral standpoints, uh, you, even today in 2019, you know, you, you wouldn't be too sure on certain aspects, not just you, but other people. You wouldn't be too sure where you stand on many aspects. So I think that there's nothing, that's nothing particular to religion. Human beings, by and large, are all going through these kind of uh, dilemmas all the time. So, so here's a problem that comes up. The Quran also says that, it, well, it calls out the Christians and the Jews for taking their rabbis as gods for making what was halal, haram, and haram, halal. Now, the Quran in many places will make a clear-cut exclamation or a moral value judgment, and then doesn't say they let go of this a few years down the road. Now, people like yourself and ulama will come up and then make those separations from the Qur'an and from slavery and whatnot. Aren't you doing exactly what the Qur'an accuses the Christians and Jews to do by taking the rabbis as gods and making haram, halal, halal, haram? Brilliant. Excellent, excellent question. And I think that this comes back to what I explained before about Qur'anic superpositions, where people are in a superposition 
It's a bit like quantum mechanics. Where do you stand? It's this, an inherent element of unpredictability. So the Quran addressed, so you will find some verses of the Quran, for example, that address people by saying things like um, that whatever harm afflicts you, it is with what you have earned. You, it's your own doing, basically. And then you'll find another verse, you know, uh, whatever harm kind of touches you from, from in Allah, it's from Allah. Now, this kind of left the scholars in a huge confusion to say, which is the default position? The default, so some people saying, well, the default position is good and bad always comes from God. Or some people saying, no, we kind of earn it ourselves because this verse says this. My understanding is that these are superpositions, if I can you know, use that term. Uh, or I can call them malm positions if, if I want to <laughs> <No. laughs> copyright it. So these so-called malm positions that a person finds himself in, it's, it becomes relative to where they are at that point in life, that it will give them that meaning. So I do accept that, yes, by reading that verse, apparently... Um, if you, you know, um, that they took uh, their rabbis and, and priests as lords, uh, it was specific to a particular thing. But you will find other verses that Allah says that in there's an Ibra if you reflect, we revealed it like this, in the hope that you will use your intellect, in the hope that you will do these things. Um, so I feel that, yes, that you can extract that message if you're just looking at that. But the Quran, if you're looking at it holistically, it doesn't, in my understanding, I know other people may disagree that it doesn't, it's not restrictive like that. Okay, so let's get to some juicy questions. <laughs> naughty, naughty. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say, so the Quran says uh, the lashing punishment or let's say chopping the hands or the stoning verse isn't there, but it used to be there, you know, in, in some hadith. No, I, all that, yeah, yeah, all that is, yeah, sorry, yeah. carry on. You can, so can we discard all of the hadood because they're irrelevant or obsolete in how society has developed now? And then where does it leave the Quran in its moral, uh, let's say, moral guidance standpoint, if you can just throw half of it out? Very good question. I think the issue of if you take, uh, you know, verse or whether it's fajli do, you know, like to lash them or these kind of verses. And there ain't many verses discussing what the hudud are, by the way. Perhaps some people refer to maybe five hudud, some people maybe a few more, a few less. But the point is, there's, there's very few verses in the entire Quran that address issues like this. Absolute few verses when you're considering, let's say, 6,000 plus verses, you know, just over a handful or maybe, you know, just under double digits we're looking at. Now, this, let's say we take this verse about stealing, those who steal. Now, do we, first of all, do I agree with the, that the rulings have changed? Of course, so many great scholars, Abu Qasim al-Burzuli, who is the Sheikh al-Islam of the Malikiyah in his day and age, from almost 600 years ago. So he predates all this kind of modernistic thinking, just in case people think this is a modern way, it's a modern interpretation. Uh, he argued ages ago in his era that, and did actually change. It wasn't just, he was influential. I mean, he was the Sheikh al-Islam and the Qadi of, uh, resided in Northwest Africa. And he implemented uh, with, from a different aspect of Hudud, said that the Hudud had changed because the people had changed. And in his day and age, they turned them into financial penalties. But, and you, you'll see in a similar time, the Ottomans, uh, Soleimano Qanuni kind of changed his into different punishments as well and things like this. So scholars have been looking at things like that for, for centuries on end. Although it may not have been the domineering voice, it may not have been the, the kind of uh, uh, the, the, the narrative that was pushed to the forefront, especially in recent times, uh, which is a different tragedy because I feel that's on a, a different discussion that I feel that there was a bit of a backlash and a regression that took place after colonialism, where people to kind of rebel against uh, what they felt was not only the colonial powers, but a sense of modernity. 
they felt that the, the, the way to do it was to dig deeper in a kind of anti-modernity kind of thing. So it became unnatural and they became more entrenched. And a lot of sociological studies show that as well, um, that people, when they were attacked, they seem to become weirdly fundamental. They don't become like, they become like weirdly fundamental. Yeah, attached so, okay, to their roots more, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, or what they may perceive to be their roots, what may not have been their roots, but they perceive to be. Right, so put that uh, aside. So coming back to this verse, so I do believe that the rulings have changed. Where does that leave this? Well, this verse of the Quran or the other few that are similar to it, they teach us many things. Like they teach us, for example, that certain things are a violation of people that they constitute what we call that these things are a violation that they constitute what is a crime and that crime shouldn't just be left uh just on on unattended to it reinforces the concept of justice it, it reminds you that punishments can carry deterrence that deterrence do work it reminds you that the greater good of the collective community needs to be honored but these it aren't unique to the Quran, though right these no, moral interests can be read from other is, books and independently but by the Quran religion. Is not claiming, the Quran is not claiming that these I've introduced these viewpoints. So these verses that still teach you that Allah wants, Allah seeks that human beings look out for their collective good and that they do administer a punishment. And then the only punishment, the actual um, the delivery the method of that punishment is what has only changed. So okay. like, let's say you've got 10 things, which one aspect of it, how it's delivered has changed because of the day and age. But I would feel as an individual that the verse still is very relevant, also in demonstrating how society has moved on as well. But, but that's like my, my on the On the verse would be like, back in the day, they didn't have prisons and, you know, and locking people up wouldn't be feasible, right? So instead they had a vengeful, more of like a deterrent punishment, penal code. Since to then me, we've evolved. The Sharia, the Sharia was not ever meant to be something holy. It was never meant to be. Oh. The Sharia was a social remedy to the problems that were being faced. Problems that are That's societal. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But then right, it so says, the, Hududullah. these are in the limits of Allah. Yeah, of course. Now that's because that would be the religious rhetoric that is always used. I mean, that's, you see, you have to put yourself in a certain, um, because things need to carry, like even today, like in the UK, in Canada, I suppose, I think it falls under sovereign as well but, uh, with England. You'll see that they will say things like, like if a person breaks the law, oh, it's against the crown. Mm -hmm. It's not against it's not against Parliament, which kind of legislated the law, but it's against the crown because it's sovereign speak. And I feel that much of that is that's all it, it reflects the society in which it would carry that weight. And in societies okay. where people obviously see Allah, they would say, "Oh, hudud Allah." Mm -hmm. So Sharia, in my understanding, it came with just remedies, which were social remedies. So none of the punishments or none of the rulings, not just punishments, but rulings uh, in Islam that we have in the Quran were new. They were all practices that the Arab world from did. the Arab size, maybe some of some exactly. the Old Testament. It may, have, it may have kind of polished them. It may have curbed them. So, for example, for stealing, people may have killed. Uh, they may have amputated an entire arm, but it said, okay, just stick to it kind of reduced. It may have had a reductionist kind of valve element, or it may have placed parameters, but it didn't, it didn't kind of introduce something that, that people were like. So for example, if it said in Arabia at that, at that time, uh, oh, anybody who does this, lock him up in a prison for six weeks, uh, even though I suppose people could argue that capture did exist, but let's say it said something totally new, which the Arabs didn't used to do, that, that they would think, well, what, or if, if, they, if it took a Persian punishment from the Sassanids and tried to introduce that, it didn't. It just kept to what the Arabs were already practicing. The example of the via, the blood money, and things like this were all okay. pre-Islamic kind of practices. So I feel that the Sharia has been 
wrongly understood, unfortunately, by not all, but many uh, people. Because when you ask Muslims, you see, when you ask Muslims, what is the Sharia? Because this is this also reflects badly on the, some of these, which I, by the way, feel are misrepresented, but some of these polls that take place internationally, uh, where they go to Muslim countries and they'll ask them, would you like the Sharia? Would you vote for the Sharia compared to uh, the, the non-Sharia, for example? Mm -hmm. And many Muslims will say, oh, I want the Sharia. I will want the Sharia. So people say, oh my God, look at these bloodthirsty, Talibanized kind of people living all over the world. You see, I feel that there's a huge kind of, um, you know, a lot of confounding variables in that uh, study. Okay, okay. Why? Why? So then, because, yeah. in many places, like the Quran itself says, لَقَدْ قَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ And then there's hadith saying that, hold on to my sunnah and the sunnah of the <laughs> caliph and the tabi'een, right? And a lot of what the Quran says is directives on people's lives a lot of morality a lot of legal a lot of jurisprudence see, uh, property so if we can throw all of that out and we say no, we're, not throwing any, we're not throwing we're not we're not throwing anything i i feel that like i gave the example of the verse of cutting the hand how i like we listed 10 let's say features all of which are still relevant except the actual mode of delivery uh i feel that look if just to explain that, like the point on the Sharia that I was, was was trying to say, that it was, you see, when people carry these kind of modes of, uh, sorry, when they carry these poles and they say, would you like the Sharia? And everybody says, yes, I want the Sharia, I want the Sharia. If you ask them, what is the Sharia? And they got, and they're going to say, oh, it's the rule of God or whatever. No, no, beyond, no, beyond a center description. We want an actual description. Like, I don't want, I want a pragmatic description, like a okay, practical okay. description. A practical so approach to morality that yes. takes some from no. the Quran and then evolves, right? No, 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 no. Before we even get to that, I mean, what do people understand when they say Sharia? So most Muslims have no idea, like, what they exactly mean. And I'll tell you what they understand is pretty much the summary. If we were to summarize the entire Quran with its morality, it can be summarized with the verse that Allah ya'murukum that uh, in Allah ya'murukum bil adli wal ihsan that indeed Allah okay. commands instructs you to justice and kindness wa ita'idhil qur'an and to humanitarian efforts now people if you ask them what is the sharia they will say oh it's about justice and if you ask them well do you mean by sharia a thick book like, is it Hanafi fiqh? Is it Maliki fiqh? Is it Shafi'i fiqh? Was it Sufyan al thawri Was it Sa'id al Musayyid? They don't even know what on earth you're on about. They, no, no, I they, totally understand your point. They feel that by when they when they have this dilemma presented to them, they feel by saying, uh, if they choose the opposite of Sharia, they translate Sharia to mean God. That are you tr do, are you preferring God? Or yeah. let's say they create a false method. dichotomy, basically. Or, yeah. yeah, so it's a false dichotomy. So this is why now coming to this thing that you're saying that look, it's not about chucking away or that the Quran is calling to a sense of false morality. It was re it was referring not just referring, sorry, it was guiding them in an understanding that they knew, uh, and this the Quran was primarily addressed to the Arabs who were around the Prophet. Okay. They were the primary recipients. So I think from this discussion, this segment of our discussion, let's follow up that ties in beautiful. Let's do a rapid fire fatwa. <laughs> <laughs> so this will bring up like the evolution of morality. Right? So for example, um, can, can, is, I, can, I just, yeah. can I just go right. pour a little drink? Yeah, yeah, sure, a drink? Sure. yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Sharab Sabni Diri. Oh boy. Whiskey or soda? Did he just say he's going to get a drink? Oh my God. <laughs> All right. So, what we'll do next is I'm going to, I have a bunch of questions, very controversial questions, and I'll take his opinion. They're all uh, like, you know, very edgy 
fatwas that he's given he's discussed in the past so and he's gotten a lot of flack for it. so we'll go through a few of them and let's see how that goes because that ties in nicely with the discussion about morality from before all right i heard you pl plotting and planning <laughs> so in, in the words in the words of ghalib hum bhi to dushman nahi hai apne ghair ko tujh se mohabbat hi sahi okay you know all right so, okay. so let's let's get to the first one right um so, uh, nowadays like we know like we have birth control and more, uh, our times have evolved we can practice Achha. safe sex yeah Bada. so what about what about what's your opinion about freeing what's <laughs> <laughs> your opinion about flirting free mixing and even premarital sex you know like nowadays what if somebody gets married to someone and then they're like oh man i'm not even satisfied now i'm stuck with this bloke for for my life right so are you okay yeah. with <laughs> um yeah so sorry what's the question <laughs> Are you okay with flirting, free mixing, and what about premarital sex? Given that we have birth control to do it safely, you know, you don't want somebody to be having make, getting married to this unknown stranger and then be like, "Oh, yeah, I'm not even satisfied with this person. I'm stuck now." Yeah, <laughs> yeah, ye ye control kabi control se nikal jata hai. ये बर्थ कंट्रोल समटाइम्स इट्स अनकंट्रोलेबल सो नो कमिंग टू दिस एंड देन द चाइल्ड सपोर्ट एजेंसी कैचेस अप टू यू राइट सो कमिंग टू यू सी दीस थिंग्स आई आई हैव बीन आस्क्ड अबाउट दिस क्वाइट अ अ फ्यू टाइम्स अबाउट रिलेशनशिप्स एंड आई हैव गॉट अ लिटिल क्लिप ऑन यूट्यूब वेयर आई गो इनटू मोर डिटेल ऑन इट इफ पीपल वांट टू हियर इट रैपिड फायर यस सो my thing is that i feel that organized religion uh organized or institutionalized religion with a capital r will always struggle and islam is no exception with these kind of things in modern times and i feel that the ulama it's not that i feel that islam doesn't have an answer necessarily but i feel that the ulama unfortunately are not people that would open uh, they themselves are just so you know they've got blinkers and they are refusing to kind of engage with uh, with certain things but coming to this question i first of all flirting these kind of things these look this is natural human interaction it's ridiculous to assume that the arabs didn't flirt that they weren't human beings or that they somehow just you know it's like i once spoke to someone and he said i went to get married and uh, sorry i went to meet a prospect to marry he he was also doing an undercover that you know this <laughs> I, this is my side chick stroke side wife <laughs> so he said i went to speak to this girl and i said i said i'm here to marry you i would like to marry these are my conditions we can meet up at uh, i don't know two times two times a month i will pay you this much money a month <laughs> she was like what the hell is this guy on about <laughs> and he was out of there so the, you see human beings don't interact like automatons or robots or they have a natural thing to them a natural flirtation what these kind of things it's ridiculous to micromanage people i think that god would it's it's i actually find it absurd to assume that god would want people to be micromanaged um if you i mean this is if you believe in god as a person i'm just saying so flirtations and things like this of course these things are just natural now people meeting each other things like that are natural uh, even in the hadith there's a hadith in sahih al-bukhari where the man is alone in the woman's house uh, abu sanabil and he's he's there discussing with her and he says oh wait a minute I thought because she's presumably in a idda I think her husband had she was a widow as in she was widowed she wasn't necessarily that old but her husband had died and she uh and he sees that she's all kind of done up because she sees that she's got all this hina and you know he's got all this so it's like a cha 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 it's like roop bara mastana lag raha so he, he's uh, uh So he says to her wait a minute i thought you're meant to be in an idda you know in a morning state and uh and she says no no my idda is finished 
And, but in Bukhari, this is him and her, and they're together in the house. And then he says, no, no, I'm sure the Ibda. And they have this kind of difference. And he says, I'm going to go ask the Prophet. So in that hadith, he asked the Prophet, and the Prophet says, no, she's right, because she said that I'd given birth. So birth kind of ended. Well, as soon as you give birth, the Iddah finishes. So it mentions that he's the one who marries her then. So he proposes. So you see that this kind of thing is just human. It's just all too human. Regarding the pre uh, having, uh, you know, like what do we do about relationships today? Because I think it is a huge problem. Trial run, trial run. <laughs> <laughs> this is a huge problem nowadays, you know, because people, the incompatibility element of modern societies is, is, is so, because people are so changing, our lives are changing, they're all about social media, can people see us, we need to be, more than being happy, being perceived as being happy is more important. So people need to put up pictures and, and when they're not doing this, they feel depressed and they think the reason I'm depressed is because I'm with her or I'm with him and, and I need to get out of this. I'm no longer in love. And uh, What do we do? First of all, divorce is not, contrary to some popular perception, not all, divorce is not a negative thing in Islam, although it's perceived like that, especially in the Indian subcontinent. But you'll see that Talaq in Islam is not negative. The uh, you know it's it's seen as pretty much neutral. That is that's how generally I read it. I mean, you'll see the verses that if you don't get on, then you, you know that they it's a farraqa, that they just kind of split and yughhni Allah kulla min saati Allah. They still wouldn't allow uh, allow premarital sex or anything. Would that be so, halal? But, so what I would say is that you see, first of all, that is an enigma from the. Uh, from capital with a capital R of religion, uh, it is difficult. But there are certain answers. How about things like muta, for example? Yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. With just an, an understanding of look, if something happens, like there will be some, you know, responsibilities, things like this. And I've, I've, I've answered that I don't believe muta is haram, and you know, many of the ulama, uh, like, uh, yeah, many of the ulama, like Ibn Ashur, and these people argued the same thing. So, I feel that. Uh, unfortunately, it's become a Sunni Shia thing. So, yeah. Okay, <laughs> now let's get to one for, more. <laughs> for, for Muta, all DMs go that way. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, so. For, for Muta, press one. For, <laughs> for all other inquiries, please just hold the line. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get to another interesting one. So we live in a very feminist society now, and women have more rights. Uh, we do. Can, in your opinion, women can women give Juma khutbas and lead men in salah, like in big congregations and masajid? Yeah. So I, it, okay. Now this is going to come back to once again. In my understanding, there's nothing in Islam that says that that can't happen. Uh, so, for example, if a woman led the prayer, would the prayer be valid? Is the question from a theological standpoint. I would feel that it's valid. Um, if a woman delivered, and thereby, by extension, if the prayer was valid, why would the khutbah not be valid? The, because women gave speeches before. I mean, you've got descriptions of Aisha radiallahu giving speeches, doing things. Now, However, the practice of Muslims generally, by and large, has always been, although there are some hadith that some women did used to lead men in the time of the Prophet, the hadith of Umm Waraqa and other, uh, in Abu Dawood and other traditions, but by and large, uh, the practice has been that men have done it. I, I, I feel that that just kind of ties into the evolutionary perspective of men just seeing women bend over and... <laughs> <laughs> They're just like, everybody's arguing to be in the first row all of a sudden. <laughs> oh, everybody's barely barely so kind. All right. Okay, let's just get another one. Very hot topic nowadays. Ali Dawa was talking about it too. So, is homosexuality a sin? And this includes uh, the LGBTQ community. Do you consider their relationship to be halal or not? Right, okay. Now this is, uh, I feel, a greater enigma than, than the previous one. 
for 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 religion, especially is Muslims. I I think other religions have tried to reconcile it probably better. Um, a lot of Muslims are obviously they've become very reactionary to this whole LGBTQ thing. Um, the irony is that, and this is quite interesting, there could be a study done into this, that it seems to be Western Muslims are more reactionary than Eastern Muslims on this topic. So, so for example, in Pakistan, you will find what they, you know, like, for example, Hijri and things like this, uh, but they're not, uh, even though people might joke around or sometimes taunt them, but they are a part and parcel of the society. And I actually found, I mean, uh, no, I need to rephrase that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I actually came to learn <laughs> that most, many, many, I don't know about most, but it seemed like most uh, men in Pakistan were bisexual to a great extent. Like they didn't seem to... <laughs> I discovered that. Yeah, guys, have guys. I still have nightmares. This is what I call the the Kari Sab effect. I found that the the uh, that the society by and large didn't describe itself as homosexual, but they. They were just like major, mega opportunists on it didn't matter so long as it, you can score. <laughs> whether it was a guy or a girl, uh, I don't know whether that was because of extreme segregation, relatively speaking. But so I find that the Muslims in the West seem to be much more kind of homophobic, so to speak. Now, coming back to the question, I don't feel that Islam, I, I've got a whole very detailed, very detailed video, if people want to watch it, called Homosexuality in Islam, A Diverse History. Uh, it's something like half an hour long or probably longer, where I go through the whole history and everything and the hadith, and I show there is no hadith addressing it and the whole issue and who, who was known as homosexual throughout historical Islamic, is, Islamic past. Uh, I feel that Islam didn't come to prohibit homosexuality, but it did prohibit it as a kind of uh, a byproduct in order to in order to emphasize the institution of marriage. So what Islam saw, you see, because the Muslims at the time, you have to understand that the Arabs, especially in Hijaz, were not really, they were still kind, they weren't nomads, but they were still kind of, they were very rough settlements still. They weren't like the way you had major, like Persopolis and these other Byzantine and these kind of civilizations. Now for society to move forward, society rests on the units of families. And to have a secure base, like families, children, upbringing, the right kind of upbringing, healthy upbringing, strong, healthy families produce a great society. So Islam needed to focus on this and thereby it obligated marriage because by, I mean, it obligated it as a way of, you know, sexual intercourse and things like this because men by and large don't want responsibility. If especially all human beings, but if they are uh, the sole breadwinners, let's say, they don't want to be responsible. You'd rather chill, like I'd rather chill and live my life than be responsible. Now, unless it was you were kind of put into it. So Islam mandated that, look, OK, have a family. Now, in order to do that, to, to, to reinforce this institution of marriage, it had to outlaw other relationships. And as a byproduct, homosexuality also got outlawed. That said, I don't think the Arab or the Hijazi community by and large had many, I'm not saying they had none, they may have had some, but I don't think they were mainly kind of bisexual people okay. uh, by and large, yeah. All right, let's move on to another question. So we have Valentine's Day, Christmas and other Illuminati festivals, <laughs> are they halal? <laughs> So I, th these kind of things, I think it's it's ridiculous for Muslims to condemn. Um, it's just an insecurity. I mean, it's just people, like I said, they don't, 
you see, their result, their people are resorting to the default uh, principle of identitarian politics in saying we know ourselves by knowing that we are not the other, that the periphery defines the center. So people feel that if I, um, well, what is a Muslim? A Muslim is that we don't celebrate Christmas. It ought to be affirmative actions of what we do, but they, they seem to, it's easier to say, well, you know, it's more primitive and easier, that kind of tribalism of saying, well, they bad, they Christian, they Christmas, we Muslim, we eat, you know, like that's a very kind of... Isn't that religion that way? inherently that way, like the whole concept of religion, it puts people into groups and then says this group will go to heaven, this group will go to hell. Then the prophet saying that you'll be raised with the people you imitate and, you know, grow the beard, cut the mustache, don't Im imitate the kuffar. Isn't this identity kind of institution? Like that? kind of Inside, yeah, that, that's, a very good that's a very good uh, point that you've made there. It's unquestionable that the Islamic... Um, the Islamic discourse, the Quranic discourse too, by extension, um, uh, or, or by inclusion, sorry, the Islamic discourse by extension does have, like any other discourse, it does have a sense of otherness. It does. Like, that's um, true. Now, why so? Why so? Because ultimately, we are all God's creatures. You know, we are all, um, we, 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 you know, if God loves one of us, he loves us all. I'm just saying, if you believe that there is a God, I'm surely he loves us all. What's the, why, why not just, look, don't worry, we're all cool, love people, peace, love, just get on with it. And I feel that ties into the human psyche, that the human psyche because I mean, from an evolutionary perspective, if you see us as uh, having, let's say, evolved as the greater primates, even primates, they are incredibly territorial and tribalistic in, in their own tribes. Now, human beings work through kind of competition. So you see in Islam that whilst the Prophet ﷺ, and I'll tell you what, what also reflects the shifting nature of this that this was not a constant that you see that when the prophet was in uh, mecca um that sallallahu alaihi wasallam you'll see that he uh, there's a huge right so okay a lot of people sometimes are unaware of this by the way but that the northern arab kingdoms which i mentioned earlier were much more influential on arab culture than people may be aware. Some people may know this, but I think most don't. So in Iraq, for example, you had, which was part of the Lakhmid, the which was an affiliate of the Sassanids, but later became independent. Uh, they broke off their kind of treaty. Uh, they got killed, actually, basically. But the point is that they, uh, they had a town called Hira. Now, Hira became like the, uh, the cultural capital for a lot of Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula. Like, there were millions of Arabs in the Middle East and only a few hundred thousand in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, so people seem to think that the Arabs existed in the Arabian Peninsula and a few were scattered. But it seems that history is showing us it was the other way around. Um, that, so Hira has a huge impact on people. So all the major poets, Nabira, Asha, Labid, all these people live up there. But anyway, my point of saying that was that you see that in early times when the Prophet is in, from the, uh, the understanding of when he's in Mecca, he affiliates himself or identifies with Jewish people quite a bit. Uh, in fact, the Hadith mentions, some Hadith, I know um, um, of Muhammad the Siqli and a few people bring it, but other people bring it as well, that the Prophet even changed his hairstyle so that the Arabs used to so the jewish people used to kind of uh, they would split center a bit like curtains uh like that and the arabs generally kind of pushed back the hair so you see that it mentions that the prophet first had it just pushed back like people around him but when he started to identify with 
because the Jewish people did like that, he started to also centre party. So you see this sense of otherness is the people of Mecca. Uh, or it doesn't have to be the people of Mecca, but the, those who are strongly opposing this. And I, uh, a human uh, identity kind of um, a sense of recognizing or affiliating. Uh, affiliation may be a strong word, but just kind of identifying with in some ways. So okay. now when the prophet moves to Medina, and as things stabilize and there's a much stronger Jewish presence, it mentioned the prophet changed his hairstyle back to the way. Okay. The other Arabs then, and I feel that one of the ways that a lot of the Arabs united, uh, so there were previous efforts before the prophet by other people who some believe was a prophet, because in some hadith the prophet said Khalid ibn Sinan al-Absi was a prophet. But he was an Arab who tried to unite a lot of people or, or, or ward off the culture of the Persians. So there was at one point there was so, a spread of Persians. I have another and, question that lean, leads on this this whole concept of borrowing or taking from other people's cultures or making your own. And sure. so, with for example, like the the idea of Kaabas or Kaabas being there, I've noticed that there was a Kaaba in Dul Khalasa and then there's Kaaba in I think Taifa or something. And then the whole concept of uh, circumambulation. Uh, and I just watched your video, I think, about the black stone and Safa Maru. <laughs> you want to point that out briefly to people that where the black stone comes from? Just briefly. Right, okay. I'm not sure exactly where the black stone comes from. Uh, the black stone is in the Kaaba, but I don't believe the black stone is holy or sacred. Uh, I believe it's, it is... Right, so okay, let me qualify that statement. It is holy or sacred by association with the concept, but not per se intrinsically. So because it's part of, let's say, the pilgrimage, which is seen as a holy uh, ritual, it's by association. A, it's like saying doing wudu is seen as a holy act, but just washing your face in the morning isn't. But when you're washing your face in wudu, it's still the same thing. But it's by association of the ritual that it gains a kind of uh, a quasi-sanctification. It's not intrinsically sacred. And I feel it may have been either a meteorite or it may have been volcanic kind of uh, residue um, as a lot of, because there were a lot of black stones um, that were in different you in, your, in your video too, that might have been part of an older god. Yeah, I, feel that, I feel that it may have been. Although in the time of the Prophet, it doesn't seem to, there's no mention of anything like that. So it may have been in the many generations before, because we know that in places like Petra, uh, there was a, uh, out of a black stone, there was a god, one of the main gods, Ulshara, and um, and like that. So some people associate it with Baal Shurin and, and some of the other That's gods. And, and so some of the other places did have black kind of stones as well i, I so, believe that so it so, may have been that that was a remnant of that paganism uh which was then incorporated as the kaaba and then as okay, generation so, went by so when you when you come to the point of incorporating pagan practices into islam mm -hmm. you also see like yeah. the concept of salah and the prayer like from zoroastrianism from before it's imported right so it, when I bring this all together, I notice that like the, the the Quran takes stories from the past and other books, and then Muhammad is taking rituals from other people and people around and pagan practices. And then you've already said that his morality is kind of you don't have to really stick to it because it evolves. Why? What? Uh, what does Islam then give to people now? Like, is it even relevant? Like, do you have to be a Muslim to go to heaven? Like, uh, okay, not the, okay, I say Muslim, quite, quite, if you can. Kind of sure, quite, quite, quite a few, sure, quite a few things. I think, uh, first of all, I don't think most Muslims, theologians, all acknowledge, or the major theologians like Fakhruddin al Razi and other people, they all acknowledge that look, you don't have to be Muslim to go to heaven. Uh, people, God could send anybody to heaven. Let's say, whatever heaven means, I mean, whatever that means to have salvation after death. Uh, now, is, is, Islam relevant if we're changing the rulings, for example, if we are changing the Sharia, if, we, if we're saying the Sharia has an inbuilt mechanism to change over time, it's meant to change. Because my argument isn't 
let's change the Sharia. My argument is the Sharia itself demands to be changed in the day and age. Well, now, not so, just the, the, the Sharia, but holistically. Like the Quran right, so, itself is borrowing, so, Muhammad things aren't so why what's the relevance of Islam in this day and age? Can right, you so I feel that this ties down to an ultimate question that what was the message of Islam? So the message of Islam was never in my understanding a set of rules. Now, that was just a secondary tertiary byproduct. The message of Islam was a message of of God and meaning. That uh, you see, the, the people, the Arabs of Hijaz did believe in God, uh, but they believed that God was kind of that Allah, the ultimate, let's say, a God, the ultimate kind of God. But they, it, it, I, my understanding, my reading is that it seems to be very similar to what is perhaps modern day Hinduism in the sense that Brahma, uh, who is the creator, Nobody really worships Brahma because they feel that he's too impersonal and too transcendent. And so we're going to worship the other gods who are closer and can relate to us and who really care about us. So I feel that the message that the, the prophet was, uh, was pursuing with his people was to bridge the gap between the impersonal God and the personal for people. Okay. In, in teaching people that God is personal. So, so yeah. a question would follow, like this is more almost like perennialism, right? Perennialist philosophy. Would a non-Muslim now, like for example, like me, I, I'm, I'm trying my best to be a good human being and stuff, although I don't accept Muhammad as the messenger, or Allah as the God of the Quran, you, as the word of God. Will I go to him now? <laughs> can I go to Jannah or... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm joking. Sorry, carry on. Sorry. So, can uh, people who are not Muslims per se or don't say the Shahada but are perfect human beings but openly reject Islam as being the word of God, would they still be able to go to heaven or no? Yeah, so, uh, so first of all, yes. Uh, they would, um, just as a simple answer. So you'll see that certain scholars, and then just to slightly give it a bit of detail, just so I don't be declared an absolute murtad. <laughs> right. so, so they just declare me as a semi murtad. <laughs> right, so the, 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 the thing would be, so you'd get scholars like, and I've been asked this a lot by people, that look, people who use you, that I advocate reason, and I do, I utterly advocate the voice of reason, um, and I believe that Islam does. I mean, that's my belief. So people have said, look, if you're promoting the voice of reason, what if reason leads you to believe that God, that Islam is incorrect or God isn't true? Like in, in your case, like reason has led you to believe that. Now, I would say that, uh, and I quoted the scholar, like a uh, great theologian, Al-Baydawi, who's been quoted by the, and is cited by the Malik, other scholars like Ubi and other people, uh, where he has this mas'ala that what if somebody uses his reason and reason leads him to feel that there is no God. Uh, and he's, he re responds by saying, well, yurja he says, we hope that he's still, that's still salvation because he did the best that the person could do. Now, I feel that Islam, is, it isn't doom and gloom in the sense that people have made it out to be. The problem is, the problem comes back to what I mentioned earlier on about humans being full of contradictions. Like human beings, you see, if we place us as a spectrum, most human beings are not philosophers. They're not kind of like very deep thinkers because Islam would be aimed at the whole, it would be a net to embrace everyone. Now, it would include those who are just working, surviving. It would include people who are not great intellectuals. It would include like all the sets from the special educational needs <laughs> to the gifted and talented. It would be a net for them all. Now, the people, like one of the problems you find is people say, 
people say that, oh, if God says, and I've had this discussion with Muslims, some Muslims, they've said to me, oh, but if you're going to say that everybody's okay, let's say they can be okay, because what's to happen in the afterlife? We have no idea what that even means, the afterlife. I have a whole video explaining that, look, I feel that the imagery of the Quran and everything is simply symbolic. What so, does the and, and do you mean to say that the, the whole idea of like there'll be fire and then they're being tortured, tying people to chains and dragging them or Jannah being a, like a like a brothel? <laughs> it's all uh, it's that, all uh, that, symbolic. That part, that, that part of Jannah, I hope, is true for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> no, so, uh, yeah, I, I feel that this whole thing, uh, the afterlife, the imagery, the imagery that's given in the Quran, the imagery. And I've got a detailed video giving more detail in case I don't do justice whilst explaining now, uh, that I feel that it's symbolic, okay? That it's not uh, literal, it's not meant to, like the fire, I feel it's just sim symbolism uh, to give people some kind of like, uh, like an awareness, a sense of fear to do something right, to do things like this. It's not really because Jahannam, the term Jahannam comes from, uh, I mean, it's derived from the 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 kind of time from in Jesus's time, the the, the mm -hmm. in the kingdom of Judea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the okay, value of in, in a sense, that uh, there there is no hurum maqsuratun fil khiyam or anything. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> no hurs in you know, tenses, guys. <laughs> what, what, what was it that Ghalib said? Ghalib said that humko malum hai jannat ki haqiqat, lekin what is it? لیکن غالب دل کو خوش رکھنے کو خیال اچھا ہے Alright, so let's do no, some Q&A no, Getting back to the question okay, uh, yeah, I, do feel, I do feel that the, the scholars had said things like look, there is salvation The problem is a lot of people, low level they feel that oh, if you say other people can be okay then why am I doing this? Why am I? And they, 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 they can't seem to get their heads around that. I feel that people that are slightly more, let's say, developed in thought and they, that they are more kind of enlightened, they can understand these things. And that was the reason the rhetoric aimed it. So the, as long as it catches the people on the lower end, the people that are gifted and talented, they will be able to understand it anyway. That's my perception. That's what Ibn Rushd kind of argues as well, the philosophy. Okay. So now uh, let's get to some question and answers. I have one here from uh, Shifaya Chaudhary. He says that, uh, are, how are you different from a Mutazilla or Mutazillites where they said primacy of reason? Are you, do you identify with their creed or do you give their creed uh, in, a, in a good light? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I've got, once again, a very detailed response on that. I'm not Mu'tazili. Mu'tazila haven't existed for hundreds of years. The Mu'tazila were not a people defined by reason. This is a, uh, a kind of re-engineered description of them by later Sunni scholars. In their time, the thing that made somebody a Mu'tazila was an extremist view that if you committed a sin, you weren't a Muslim, but you weren't a Kafir either. They invented a purgatory state called Al-Manzila Bain Al-Manzila Tain. And what they said is that anybody who commits a sin is no longer a Muslim, but he hasn't entered. He's not a Kafir. He's in a purgatory in between state, between the two. And he just stays there until he becomes Muslim again. And so initially they arose very earlier on. They were um, kind of extreme in their way of thinking because maybe 100 years later, 250 years later, a lot of the Mu'tazila scholars to refute Sunni scholars uh, a lot of the Mu'tazila scholars were linguists and they were intelligent people. So they started to use some points of reason to prove some of their points. So unfortunately, the worst thing that ever could have happened happened was some of the Sunni scholars to get back at them started to demote reason. Whereas if you look at the primary Sunnis, they all promoted reason. Now, they start to say, Oh, but you're trying to disprove me by using your akal. Ha 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 ha. That's a dumb thing. And okay. then this culture emerged. So nowadays, people will teach you when you go to the local Mulvi Saab and you ask him a decent question, and because he's unfortunately from the lower set, in <laughs> he's like from the special educational needs in <laughs> his ability to answer. Uh, 
he will, instead of saying, I don't know the answer, he'll say, oh, don't be silly, you're using your aqal. The Mu'tazila used to use their aqal. That's, that's just a dumb thing. I mean, the aqal is so the crazy. Quran says, right? The Quran says, exactly, exactly. yeah, okay. So another, another very controversial question here is, are Ahmadis Muslim and can they go to heaven? I, I, anybody can go to heaven. <laughs> it's, a, it's just a chilled out place. <laughs> okay, okay. And, and then we find out, and then we find out the only two that didn't make it were us two. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So another question you talked about being chilled no, so, out. So. <laughs> I, feel, I feel anybody can go to 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 Jan the Jannah thing. As in, look, Allah's mercy isn't restricted to any uh, you know against anyone. The unfortunate thing with Ahmadis is it's a political thing. Unfortunately, like many like many religious things, they become so like human beings. They become so intertwined with politics. And the Ahmadiyya as well, what happened is, you see, if you study the early uh, development of the Ahmadi school, they initially, not the very, I don't mean Ulam Ahmad, but shortly after, you'll see that they had a very reactionary approach, very harsh approach, declaring other people non-Muslims, declaring uh, all of these things, which then had an equally and a great kind of like a catastrophe Clismic kind of uh, reaction to them, which has still lasted, and therefore in Pakistan they've declared them non-Muslim, and now and then it's become that thing that we identify through what we're not. Mm -hmm. So people will say, "What makes you a Sunni Muslim?" Well, we believe that they are kafir. <laughs> you know, so, it's like what? Is, so another another very important question: Khatme Nabuwat, the the seal of prophethood. Uh, is that essential in any sense of the word to be a Muslim or to go to heaven? Right, okay. It's essential to Islam. It's essential to Islam. I mean, this the question of heaven, I'm not... You see, it's interesting because when you look at the... Like, Islam acknowledges, not only acknowledges, it endorses Judaism, as in... Jew, Jewish people were correct, you know, they were with Moses, they were so on and so forth, the Israelites. In fact, the, the Quran spends a considerable amount of time just speaking about the Israelites as being favored. Now, yet the Jewish people had no concept of the afterlife. Like it just wasn't, it's not that, it's just, it's not affirmed nor negating. It's not, it's just not there. And it's with Jesus that the whole thing of the kingdom of heaven and whether some argue the kingdom of heaven was on earth. And then with Islam, it's made much more descriptive. I feel that the afterlife, we've just become unnecessarily obsessed over, over this. Well, wouldn't the, you the say that the Quran itself is obsessed with the concept of afterlife? Why would it spend so much time, so many verses and give such graphic, sadistic, torture descriptions that'll... Like put the, the most ambitious psychopath to shame almost. Yeah, because I, right now, I feel that it was it stressed the importance, right? So when you look at the afterlife, there's the uh, the underpinning kind of concept that life does not end with this. Like this is not the end of everything. I think that was the most important thing. The problem was that. Um, you see, to some people, I suppose it comes back to that, what is it that motivates a certain people and what is it that kind of deters a certain people? And, and you've got to remember that there's certain, like some interesting studies have been done, Jeremy Bentham, other people as well, on how people react, what kind of, um, I don't know if threats is the right word, but what kind of negative uh, motivations uh, are used when, there's, when people are much more lawless like tribal societies are not the same as like societies that was sit, like had kings and things like that, like Shaul. So sometimes you would use greater deterrence because there's a less chance of things because people are more wild. So you use a greater deterrent. Mm -hmm. So when as societies kind of calms down, you use less deterrence. So I feel it's in line with that. I do feel it like so if we look at the Quran, for example, the, there's many verses, forget the afterlife, we speak about God. 
which one would argue is the ultimate. There's many verses like Allah samawati wal ard, Allah is the light of the which most Muslims would accept is symbolic. Uh, there's some verses of the, uh, like, let's say the verses describing Allah, like I don't mean just saying he's merciful and knowledgeable, but like Allah has a hand or a face or a foot or things like this or a shank. Now these things, most Muslims don't, <laughs> most, uh, most Muslims don't accept these things where literally. Is that, the where, where is that verse in the Quran? Yawma tudawna ila saqiyun in Surah Al-Qalam, right? Yawma yukshafu ansar. Yeah, that, 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 when the, the shank of Allah will yeah. become visible. <laughs> And they will be called. But this was like, if you use that, like if you get that thing and you look at the Arabs, like how they use that as an idiom, like they would say, when they would describe the, the war, because when the Arabs, they wore thobes, when, they, when, they were, when, when the two kind of armies or whatever they were, the tribes met. Uh, and when they were, when it was like, get go, we're going to go, like they get their spears, they get their swords. When they're ready to run, they would lift the thobe and reveal the shank. Oh. It meant that they're ready to run. Now, it meant that the matter is now serious. So oh, apart okay. from the Salafis, the Salafis who became very kind of like are weird and believe in a kind of, unfortunately, like a, a, a God has a, a body and that to a very kind of like a disabled body. But generally, other Muslims didn't feel that. But these verses they felt were symbolic describing God. So if God could be symbolically described, um, and that's God himself, then the afterlife, some verses, they all, many agree, were symbolic. Like, let's say, the paradise, it's with Ardu has samawati wal ard, it's the width of the heavens and the earth. Most mm. people say that's not the actual width. Like, if you measured the heavens and the earth, it's not the actual. It's just okay. a metaphor. So, I would argue that why not the afterlife, as people like Ibn Rushd said, that the afterlife was more about consciousness. But, uh, yeah, so I, I, I do agree that, yes, there is... I mean, it's not the whole Quran, but there is, it is definitely there. It's a salient property within the Quran that you see this narrative. But I feel that was to trigger the people and to get them because of the, 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 the kind of wild society that they were. Mm -hmm. Okay, so one, one very interesting question. Since uh, I'm in Canada, here it's been legalized. <laughs> what, is, what is that? <laughs> We've been legalized. Yeah. What about weed? Ah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is your opinion? Is is it halal? <laughs> Let me just have my cocaine. And <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, I, I feel these things are. Uh, I've said for a while now. I've said that. Look, um, these things are a matter of uh, legality and not theology. That I don't feel that these things are haram or thing. I'm, I'm not saying that Islam, I don't think Islam necessarily encourages people to do it, but it just leaves them. Like, like I, I have said, I think smoking is bad. Um, I don't smoke personally, and I think it's, it's, it's just detrimental and it's harmful. That said, I don't believe it's haram because oh, it's Islam bad. does. All right. <laughs> so uh, Islam doesn't micromanage people like that. Just like having sugar is, if you have it in certain quantities, it's definitely harmful, but it's not going to be haram mm -hmm. to say well, having sugar. Yeah. So, so what, what about alcohol? Because in one place in Surah Baqarah, it said that it used to be okay. It had some benefit, but the cons outweigh the benefit. But then it says that don't drink while you're not, while you're praying, but you can drink other places. And eventually in Surah Maida, verse 90, it said that you have to stop. So how do you view alcohol? Are you okay with a couple of beers once in a while? <laughs> 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 All right, that's my answer, I guess. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> All right, all right. So we have about 10 minutes and we got to end. <laughs> sure. I, I, you see, alcohol, I feel that the Quran was reasonably clear on why it prohibited alcohol, which, to be fair, are very reason based arguments. Um, it it kind of just said that, look, it causes, you know, it allows you, it like causes disputes, causes fights, causes things, animosity, enmity. Uh, and it, 
it's understandable that it, it does cause deaths. It does cause. It's one of the things. It's shocking, actually, in these societies where uh, things like, let's say, like we said, cannabinoids are outlawed. Where things like DMT is is considered uh, illegal, yet alcohol and these things have not had a single known death till date. Like there's not been a single death. There isn't. I mean, with things like DMT, there isn't a single. There isn't any data to suggest that it has. In fact, all the data suggests there's no levels of dependency. There's no levels of addiction. Uh, it's and yet there's not a single death till. Uh, and yet these things are outlawed and alcohol, which does lead to several deaths, costing the health system, leading to great violence, leading to great abuse. Yet it's deemed it's it's I just feel the, the you know, the irony in society. OK, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, so we have like 10 minutes and we got to wrap it up. So just one so word on. So uh, we've almost Whoa, touched I just hours. the time. We've always been. <laughs> Chinese so, for quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> so the, these these Dava characters in the UK, or you know, this Dava gang like Ali Dava and Dava Man mm -hmm. and stuff. You know, what do you think about these kind of people? Because uh, they kind of make Islam look really bad. Would you be okay? Yeah. I remember in one video you said preaching should be stopped, and there's nothing good in Islam. Even if you wouldn't convert if you weren't born Muslim. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I never I never said there's nothing good in Islam, but I said that. I don't feel that Islam is about, especially I can understand in its early stage, Islam was about kind of like spreading the message. But by and large, the message has spread, like not now, from centuries ago. Islam today is pretty much where it was hundreds of years ago, like in, far of, in terms of its diaspora in that sense. I know there's a greater population of humans and stuff, but you get the picture of what I'm trying to say. Now, I feel that it's not, we're not kind of, you know, some people feel that we are here just to, oh, we've got to convert everyone, we've got to do this, we've got to do this, otherwise, oh, and, and they're guilt-driven to do this because they, people brainwash them into thinking, if you don't do this, you're sinful. And Islam doesn't say that anyway. In fact, Islam speaks of that there will be, like, let's say, Jews and Christians that exist with you. Why was it not trying to convert everyone? They didn't have this image that there won't be the other. There will be many others. So now I said that, look, I, I don't know what this obsession about uh, converting people. Don't get me wrong. If people wish to convert, I, I find it amazing. I did mention that. I find it amazing that people do. I said I'm actually shocked people convert in this day <laughs> because, of the, <laughs> because of the bad publicity that Islam has got. I do feel that Islam like has a great lot, a great deal to offer. I, I do feel that in this day and age, from if you take the major league of world religions, let's say the top six. Uh, in my understanding, Islam would be the only one that could truly uh, stand the test of time today. Uh, if any, I, I mean, I, I know you would feel that, it, it, you know, probably not agree with that. But the point is, I feel that it would have an answer that actually works with that could reconcile some. Data. It may not be widely accepted, but it could provide answers. And that's the same kind of thing you'll see that Clark said as well when he the famous sci-fi uh, novelist as well. But my point is, so I do feel it has a great deal to offer in terms of meaning, in terms of uh, humanitarian brotherhood, in terms of people need some kind of ritual, some sense of belonging. It has a kind of like an interracial great uh, sense of family. Um, it does teach things like it has a huge emphasis on humanitarian things. In the UK, there was a study which found Muslims, despite being the minority, were amongst the most charitable kind of communities. Mm -hmm. So I think that this kind of stuff, it has a huge amount to offer and it has more to offer, which unfortunately, the, like the clergy and the institutions have kind of sidelined the humanitarian aspect. You know, it's, it's like shit on the nitty gritty details and micromanaging people, right? Like, don't wear this clothes, don't look like that and all that stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, exactly. Somebody asked Muhammad al-Ghazali, for example, what does Islam have to offer? I remember reading in one of his things and he said, well, how about the thing that you don't sleep with a full stomach knowing that your neighbor is hungry? Like, yeah. people don't really emphasize this anymore. Like, they emphasize just the, why is your beard not like this? Why is your, you know, the, the dumb, you know, dumb kind of, measures by which they've turned religion into so yeah so i do i did say that I, I i don't understand the obsession with converting people 
the Dawa figures that you have, in my understanding today in the West, there are very few people that I would be comfortable with when I listen to them. Um, obviously, there's some people who are great speakers, great orators, and they do great work, like they're great face, like Sheikh Hamza Yusuf in the, in the West. I'm not saying what all his views are, but just he, he does have a great way of kind of uh, presenting, a presentability, a kind of uh, a great interaction. And that's all. Um, and then there's people like you mentioned, like Dawa Man or other people, Ali Dawa. Uh, I've never met, I mean, actually, I've met both of them. Um, <laughs> I've met Dawa. I was going to say I never met Dawa Man. I did meet him several years ago. He wasn't as bit, I suppose, as popular, if you want to use popular as he is now. But my point is, those people I feel distort. Uh, they, I don't think they, I think they, in their own views, are, are reasonably sincere. Um, I don't think they think they're distorting. They think they're kind of preserving something, but that thing that they're preserving is doing much more harm to the face of religion in, from my perspective. Obviously, they wouldn't agree with that. I accept that. Like them pushing this thing that Aisha was a young girl, for example. I, I don't know why anybody would do something like that. Mm -hmm. I find it disastrous. I find it personally, uh, just hear it from Muslims, I find it disrespectful. I can understand non-Muslims are saying it. So, yeah. So right. I, I, I'm, very, I'm not very pleased with... Yeah. <laughs> but I'm sure they're not very pleased with me. They probably think... Oh, he washes down the, the religion. You know, he's kind of like too, uh, he's a, a, a sellout or he's, I don't know, he's kind of like, so I'm sure they're not pleased with, with my uh, interpretation. Yeah, no, they're not. <laughs> so, uh, uh, just <laughs> got just five minutes. Confusion, <laughs> khatam <laughs> yeah. So, in the last five minutes, do you have any message for your for the people watching, the audience, and advice to Muslims? Just a quick word, and then we'll try to wrap it up. Sure, absolutely. I, I feel that, first of all, I'd like to reiterate this thing about uh, ex-Muslims. I feel that, um, that ex-Muslims are people who actually take, and atheists, maybe not all, but many atheists, who actually take religion quite seriously. Um, and in some ways, in some ways, maybe too seriously, like they take it so serious that they are always preoccupied with religion. And that to me, I see, I'm, I kind of, I'm, I meet that with a sense of kind of like wonder, with a sense of kind of welcoming that critique, even if it leads to look, people not wanting to be part of the faith, but at least they are thinking about it. You know, they, they, they're not... Um, you know, Allah, this, this, uh, to quote a verse of the Quran, <laughs> you know, don't let your um, hostility or adversity of a people lead you to being, uh, lead you away from justice. So people that kind of attack or hate on ex-Muslims, um, I think that's utterly, utterly wrong. It's utterly unacceptable. They need to... and. Yeah, you know, and I've I've read things against you. I've read things against Abdullah Samir. I've read things against um, just silly things. I've read personal attacks against your your wife, against things like this, and and you guys take it on the chin. And you know, I commend you, applaud you for that. And it, but I just feel that that's utterly wrong. I feel that if anything is the antithesis of what Islam is advocating. The Prophet would never have condoned, uh, in my understanding, any of that uh, behavior or attitude. I mean, I get hate as well. Don't get me wrong. I get a lot of hate. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not a look style here. <laughs> but I feel, that, I feel that, you you know, like sometimes, obviously, when it comes against you, I still get a lot of respect as well. But I uh, I, I see that it's just it's just wrong. So I, I wanted to reinforce that, that it's about human beings, okay, humanity, first of all. And secondly, I would like to say that I feel that... He, Coming back to my point at the beginning of this conversation, this dialogue, was that, look, people, human beings, will always be in a perpetual search for some something, some meaning, some resonance that they feel is, you know, it's, it's and this, this is everywhere. This is whether it's in science, whether it's in quantum physics, whether it's in, you know, people are... Constantly, they're, they're in this search, and I feel that that is the human journey. And uh, and in 
I do feel in faith, in scripture, that people find a sense of comfort, even if they're not so familiar sometimes with the finite details, but it provides them that kind of uh, that support mechanism to maybe get through certain um, difficult parts of this journey. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, I, and I obviously do support uh, faith. And I would say that people who are, well, let's say, watching this, maybe now or, or later on when it's uploaded, um, if they have questions, in my perspective, I feel that there is nothing within Islam that is truly counter of reason. Yes, maybe the way it's presented by certain people or the way it's looked at from a, an angle, it may seem counter reason, but otherwise I do feel everything does fit in and it's just a matter of perspective. So it's not, they don't necessarily need to feel like, because we are in an age where some people are feeling a bit embarrassed as well of like, um, and I feel that that's not, you know, it's, it's not necessary to feel embarrassed, like having, and just as we spoke earlier on about art and speaking about different things, music, that truth values, what, what gives value and how do we actually interpret what truth is, that these are great discussions, complicated discussions. But yeah, but at the same time, this is an amazing dialogue. This is an uh, amazing, I feel that, you know, like speaking to people that disagree with you makes you think. Like you, you saying things when I speak to other atheists, I, it makes me, some of my greatest thoughts have actually come to me during uh, where I've had to, had a dialogue and been forced to evaluate. But so that's my short, brief message. All right, so, all right. So it was an amazing conversation. I mean, I mean that's, the, I, 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 that's the thing man. It's such a journey. <laughs> it, was, it was an amazing discussion I can't thank you enough for doing this and I'm finally getting to know your views and where you're coming from and your approach and I commend you for putting this new approach the pro-reason approach pro-reason interpretation of the religion out there because it's direly needed I mean if anything I see Muslims as the biggest victims of this mullahism extremism you know and we need to get them out of this and i see you so, as a so many people fresh are fed up with I have, I have so many people they message me they're so worried they're so fed up because what happens is what a lot of people don't realize is people there are people who want to leave the faith and that's to me i have no objection there's many people who don't necessarily want to leave like they want to believe in something but they're kind of being strong-armed into it because they're so fed up of what the clergy, the mullahs are telling them. And the mullahs basically tell them, if you don't accept this, you're a kafir anyway. And then they think, ah, oh, well, screw it. You know, there's this, I remember my teacher in <laughs> Damascus once said, he said like, oh, he, uh, this guy was in the hammam in one of those kind of, uh, those, those baths uh, that they have, like Turkish hammams. And he said, and he came out and he had a towel, but it was just slightly lower, like, so the navel and that was, exposed and he came out with a towel and the person some guy said oh stop for a lot of <laughs> so he didn't know what it was about he, he said like what, what what's going on what's going on and the guy said oh stop for a lot and then he said he said what, what? And the guy said well your your navel below the navel it's showing so he said oh this he said in that case he just dropped, in that case he just dropped his towel <laughs> oh, man. we can keep going for hours and hours you know it's already been three hours yeah, I mean. it's, it's, wow 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 it, and i really uh, i know i i did message also we spoke briefly over social media to harris sultan as well recently i yeah. i love his uh, interview with um what um hamza and, and, and I did say that, wow, and I think that that's an amazing, it was very, very much like this discussion. It was very, it was, it was engaging. It, I mean, it was, yeah, I mean, there's no disrespect in any, in, in either way. I mean, and, you know, and, and I felt that that's so, so much needed as well. But yeah, so that's shukran as well side. for taking the time out. And I'll say bye-bye to uh, Mujaddid, Mujtahid of this century, Mufti Azam of the British Isles, <laughs> Mufti Malana, Maulvi, Kari Sahab, Babu Lais, Ahmad Barakat, Muhammad Aliya, Rahimahamullah. And this, Assalamu Alaikum, Marhaba.
Amazing. Right. Join us. All right. Inshallah. Take care, man. Stay blessed. Assalamu alaikum.